The Pillars of Creation by Terry Goodkind Continuing on page 337 With deliberate care, gripping the thing behind the head with one hand, Oba pressed the blade upward with his other. The tough scales, like pale white armor, resisted penetration. The snake, now under threat from Oba's deadly blade, suddenly began struggling, not to dominate this time, but to escape. Muscular coils unwrapped from Oba's legs, sweeping across the ground, trying for purchase against roots and saplings, searching for anything to latch onto. With his foot, Oba pulled a length of the shimmering green body back toward him, preventing any escape. The razor-sharp blade, with Oba's powerful muscles pushing it, suddenly popped through the thick scales under the jaw. Oba watched, fascinated, as blood ran down his fist. The snake went wild with fear and pain. Any thoughts of conquest were long forgotten. Now it wanted desperately to get away. The animal put all its considerable strength to that effort alone. But Oba was strong. Nothing ever escaped him. Straining with the effort, he dragged the twisting, turning, writhing body up onto higher, drier ground. He grunted as he lifted the heavy beast. Holding it aloft, screaming with fury, Oba ran forward. With a mighty lunge, he drove his knife into a tree, pinning the snake there with the blade through its lower jaw and roof of its mouth, like a long third fang. The snake's yellow eyes watched helpless as Oba drew another knife from his boot. He wanted to see the life go out of those wicked yellow eyes as they watched him. Oba made a slit in the pale underbody, in the fold between rows of scales. Not a long slit, not a slit that would kill, just a slit big enough for his hand. Oba grinned. Are you ready? he asked the thing. It watched, unable to do anything else. Oba pushed his sleeve up his arm as far as he could, then wormed his hand in through the slit. It was a tight fit, but he wriggled his hand, then his wrist, then his arm into the living body farther and farther as the snake whipped side to side, not just in its futile effort to escape, but now in agony. With a knee, Oba pinned the body to the trunk of the tree, and with a foot held down the thrashing tail. For Oba, the world seemed to vanish around him as he felt what it was like to be a snake. He imagined he was becoming the animal in its living body, feeling its skin around his own as he pushed his arm in. He felt its warm, wet insides compressed around his flesh. He slithered his hand in deeper. He had to stand closer so that he could get his arm down in farther until his eyes were only inches from the snakes. Looking into those eyes, he was wildly exhilarated at seeing not just brutal pain but the most marvelous terror. Oba felt his destination pulsing through the slippery viscera. Then he found it, the living heart. It beat furiously in his hand, throbbing and jumping. As they gazed deeply into each other's eyes, Oba squeezed with his powerful fingers. In a thick, warm, wet gush, the heart burst. The snake thrashed with the sudden, wild strength of death. But as Oba held the quivering, burst heart, each of the snake's movements became progressively more labored, more sluggish, until with one last rolling flip of its tail, it went still. The whole time, Oba stared into the yellow eyes until he knew they were dead. It wasn't the same as watching a person die, because it lacked that singular connection of human identity. There were no complex human thoughts with which he could relate, but it was still thrilling to see death enter the living. He was liking the swamp better all the time. Victorious and blood-soaked, Oba squatted at the water's edge, washing himself and his knives clean. The entire encounter had been unexpected, rousing, and satisfying, although he had to admit that it was nowhere near as exciting with a snake as it was with a woman. With a woman, there was the thrill of sex added into the experience, the thrill of having more than his hand inside her as death entered her, too, to share her body with him. There could be no greater intimacy than that. It was sacred. The dark water was turned red by the time Oba had finished. The color made him think of Jensen's red hair. As he straightened, he checked to make sure he had all his belongings and hadn't lost anything in the struggle. He patted his pocket for the reassuring presence of his hard-earned wealth. His money purse wasn't there. In cold panic, he thrust his hand in his pocket, but the purse was gone. 
he realized that he had to have lost it in the water while struggling with the snake. He kept the purse on the end of a thong he tied to a belt loop so as to be sure it was safe and couldn't be accidentally lost. He didn't see how it was possible, but the knot in the leather thong must have come loose in the struggle. He turned a scowl on the dead thing slumped in a heap at the base of the tree. In a screaming rage, Oba lifted the snake by the throat and pounded the lifeless head against the tree until the scale started sloughing off. Panting and drained from the effort, Oba finally halted. He let the bloody mass slip to the ground. Despondent, he decided he would have to dive back into the water and search for his missing money. Before he did, he made one last despairing check of his pocket. Looking closer, he saw then that leather thong he kept tied to his belt loop was still there. It hadn't come undone after all. He pulled the short length of leather out in his fingers. It had been cut. Oba turned, looking back the way he had come. Clovis. Clovis was always pushing up close, yammering away like a pesky fly buzzing around him. When Oba had bought the horses, Clovis had seen the money purse. With a growl, Oba glared back through the swamp. A light rain had begun to fall, making but a whisper against the living canopy of leaves. The drops felt cool on his heated face. He would kill the little thief, slowly. Clovis would no doubt feign innocence. He would beg to be searched to prove he didn't have the missing money purse. Oba figured the man would likely have buried the money somewhere, intending to come back later and retrieve it. Oba would make him confess. There was no doubt in his mind about that. Clovis thought he was clever, but he had not met the likes of Oba Rall before. Striking out back through the swamp to wring the hawker's neck, Oba didn't get far before he stopped. No. It had taken him a good long time to get this far. He had to be close to Althea's by now. He couldn't let his anger rule him. He had to think. He was smart. Smarter than his mother, smarter than Lethea the sorceress, and smarter than a scrawny little thief. He would act out of deliberate intent, not out of blind anger. He could deal with Clovis when he was finished with Althea. In a dark mood, Oba started out again toward the sorceress. Chapter 37 Watching from a distance through the slow fall of rain, Oba didn't see anyone outside the cedar log house that lay beyond the tangled undergrowth and trees. There had been tracks, the boot prints of a man, around the shore of a small lake. The tracks weren't fresh, but they had led Oba up a path to the house. Smoke from the chimney curled lazily in the stagnant, humid air. The house up ahead, almost hidden under trailers of moss and vines, had to be the home of the sorceress. No one else would be fool enough to live in such a miserable place. Oba crept lightly on the balls of his feet, up the back steps, up onto the narrow porch. Around in front, columns made of thick logs supported a low, overhanging roof. Out beyond the wide front steps lay a broad path, no doubt the way visitors timidly approached the sorceress for a telling. In the grip of rage and well beyond any pretense of being polite enough to knock, Oba threw open the door. A small fire burned in the hearth. With only the fire and two little windows, the place was rather dimly lit. The walls were covered with fussy carvings, mostly of animals, some plain, some painted, and some gilded. It was hardly the way Oba chose to carve animals. The furnishings were better than any he had ever grown up with, but not nearly as nice as he had become accustomed to. Near the hearth, a woman with big, dark eyes sat in an elaborately carved chair, the finest of the furnishings, like a queen on her throne, quietly watching him over the rim of a cup as she sipped. Even though her long golden hair was different, and she didn't have that hauntingly austere cast to her face, Oba still recognized her features. Looking into those eyes, there could be no doubt. It was Lethea's sister. Eyes. That was something on one of the mental lists he kept. I am Althea, she said, taking a cup away from her lips. Her voice wasn't at all like her sister's. It conveyed a sense of authority, as did Lethea's voice, yet it didn't have the haughty ring that went with it. She didn't rise. I'm afraid you've arrived much sooner than I expected. Seeking to quickly nullify any potential threat, Oba ignored her and hurried to the rooms at the rear, checking first the room where he saw a workbench. Clovis had told him that Althea had a husband, Friedrich, 
And, of course, there had been a man's boot prints outside. Chisels, knives, and mallets were laid out in an orderly fashion. Each could be a deadly weapon in the right hands. The place had the tidy look of work put up for a time. My husband is gone to the palace, she called from her chair by the fire. We're alone. He checked for himself anyway, looking in the bedroom and found it empty. She was telling the truth. But for the rain on the roof, the place was quiet. The two of them were indeed alone. Finally confident that they would not be disturbed, he returned to the main room. Without a smile, without a frown, without worry, she watched him coming toward her. Oba thought that if she had any brains, she should at least be worried. If anything, she looked resigned or maybe sleepy. A swamp with its heavy, humid air could certainly make a person drowsy. Not far from her chair on the floor off to the side rested a square board with an elaborate gilded symbol on it. It reminded him of something on one of his lists of things. A pile of small, smooth, dark stones sat to the side on the board. A large red and gold pillow lay near her feet. Oba paused, suddenly realizing the connection between one of the things on his lists and the gilded symbol on the board. The symbol reminded him of the dried base of a mountain fever rose, one of the herbs Lathea used to put in his cures. Most of Lathea's herbs were already ground up, but that one never was. She would crush a single one of the dried flowers only just before she added it to his cure. Such an ominous conjunction could only be a warning sign of danger. He had been right. This sorceress was the threat he had been concerned she might be. Fists. Flexing at his side, Oba towered over the woman as he glared down at her. Dear spirits, she whispered to herself, I thought that I would never again have to stare up into those eyes. What eyes? Darken Rall's eyes, she said. Her voice carried a thread of some distant quality, maybe regret, maybe hopelessness, maybe even terror. Darken Rall's eyes. A grin stole onto Oba's face. That's very generous of you to mention. Not a trace of a smile visited her. It was not a compliment. Oba's smile curdled. He was only mildly surprised that she knew he was the Darken Rawl's son. She was a sorceress, after all. She was also Lathea's sister. Who knew what that troublesome woman might have tattled from her eternal place in the world of the dead? You're the one who killed Lathea. Her words were not so much question as condemnation. While Oba felt confident, because he was invincible, he remained wary. Though he had feared the sorceress Lathea his whole life, she had in the end turned out to be less formidable than he had reckoned. But Lathea was not the equal of this woman, not by any means. Rather than answer her accusation, Oba asked a question of his own. What's a hole in the world? She smiled a private smile, then held a hand out. Won't you sit and have some tea with me? Oba guessed that he had the time. He would have his way with this woman, he was sure of that. There was no rush to be done with it. In a way, he regretted having rushed right into it with Lathea, before he'd thought to get answers to everything first. Done was done, he always said. Althea, though, would answer all his questions. He would take his time and be sure of it. She would teach him many new things before they were finished. Such long-anticipated gratification should be savored, not rushed. He cautiously sank into the chair. A pot sat on the simple little table between the two chairs, but there was no second cup. Oh, I'm sorry, she said, when she noticed his eyes searching and realized the omission. Please go to the cupboard over there and get a cup. You're the hostess of this tea party. Why don't you go get it for me? The woman's slender fingers traced the spiral curves at the ends of the chair's arms. I'm afraid that I'm a cripple. I can't walk. I'm only able to drag my useless legs around the house and do a few simple things for myself. Olba stared at her, not knowing if he believed her. She was sweating profusely, a sure sign of something. She was sure to be terrified in the presence of the man powerful enough to do away with her sorceress sister. Maybe she was trying to distract him, hoping to make a run for it as soon as he turned his back. Althea took her skirt between forefingers and thumbs and lifted the hem in a dainty manner, allowing him to see her knees and a little bit higher. He leaned over for a look. Her legs were mangled and withered. They looked like they had died ages ago and not been buried. Oba found the sight fascinating. 
Althea lifted an eyebrow. Crippled, as I said. How? Your father's work. Well, wasn't that just something? For the first time, Oba felt a very tangible connection to his father. He had had a difficult and trying morning, and was entitled to a leisurely cup of tea. In fact, he found the notion provocative. What he had in mind for her would be thirsty work. Oba crossed the room and retrieved the biggest cup from among the collection he found on a shelf. When he set the cup down, she poured it full of a dark, thick tea. Special tea, she explained when she noticed the frown on his face. It can be terribly uncomfortable here in the swamp, what with the heat and humidity. This helps clear the head, too, after the onus of a morning's difficult tasks. Among other things, it will sweat the weariness from tired muscles, such as from a long walk. His head was pounding after his tough morning. Although his clothes were finally dry after his swim and the blood had all been washed off, he wondered if she could somehow sense the difficult time he'd had. There was no telling what this woman could do, but he wasn't worried. He was invincible, as Lathea's end had proved. Your tea will help all that. Oh, yes, it's a very powerful tonic. It will cure many problems. You'll see for yourself. Oba saw that she was drinking the same thick tea. She was sweating, sure, so he figured she was right about that. She downed the rest of her cupful and poured herself another. She held her cup up in toast. To sweet life while we have it. Oba thought it an odd toast. It sounded almost as if she was admitting that she knew she was about to die. To life, Oba said, lifting his cup to tap against hers. While we have it. Oba took a gulp of the dark tea. He grimaced at recognizing the taste. It was what the symbol on the board represented, the mountain fever rose. He had learned to identify the bitter taste from the times when Lethea crushed one and added it to his cure. Drink up, his companion said. Her breathing seemed labored. She took a few long swallows. As I said, it will solve a lot of problems. She drained the rest in her cup. He knew that Lethea, despite her mean streak, sometimes mixed up cures to help sick people. While he'd waited on her to make cures for him and his mother... He had seen her crush up a mountain fever rose in many a concoction she mixed for others. Now Althea was downing it by the cupful, so she obviously had faith in the distasteful herb, too. Such heavy humidity always gave Oba a headache. Despite the bitter taste, he took another sip, hoping it would help his sore muscles in addition to clearing his head. I have some questions. You mentioned that, Althea said, peering at him from over the rim of her cup. And you expect me to provide answers. That's right. Oba took another swallow of the heavy tea. He grimaced again. He didn't know why the woman called it tea. There was no tea about it. It was just ground, dried mountain fever rose in a little hot water. Her dark-eyed gaze followed as he set the big cup on the table. The wind had picked up, beating the rain in against the window. Oba guessed he'd made it to her house just in time. Foul swamp. He turned his attention back to the sorceress. I want to know what a hole in the world is. Your sister said that you could see holes in the world. Did she now? I don't know why she would say such a thing. Oh, I had to convince her, Oba said. Am I going to have to convince you too? He hoped so. He tingled with the anticipation of getting to the blade work, but he was in no rush. He had time. He enjoyed playing games with the living. It helped him understand how they thought so that when the time came and he looked into their eyes, he was better able to imagine what they were thinking as death hovered close. Althea tilted her head in gesture to the table between them. The tea won't help if you don't have enough. Drink up. Oba waved off her concern and leaned closer on an elbow. I've traveled a long way. Answer my question. Althea finally looked away from his glare and used her arms to lower her weight from her chair down onto the floor. It was quite a struggle. Oba didn't offer to help. It fascinated him to watch people struggle. The sorceress pulled herself to the red and gold pillow, dragging her useless legs behind. She worked herself into a sitting position and folded her dead legs up before herself. It was difficult, but she managed with precise and efficient moves that looked well practiced. All the effort puzzled him. Why don't you use your magic? She peered up at him with those big dark eyes so filled with silent condemnation. Your father did the same to my magic as he did to my legs. Oba was stunned. He wondered if his father had been invincible too. Perhaps Oba had always been meant to be his father's true heir. Perhaps fate had finally stepped in 
and rescued Oba for better things. You mean you're a sorceress, but you can't do magic? As distant thunder rumbled through the swamp, she gestured to a place on the floor. While Oba sat down before her, she dragged over the board with the gilded symbol and placed it between them. I was left with only a partial ability to foretell things, she said, nothing else. If you wished to, you could strangle me with one hand while finishing your tea with the other. I could do nothing to stop you. Oba thought that might take some of the fun out of it. Struggle was part of any genuinely satisfying encounter. How much could a crippled old woman struggle? At least there was still the terror, the agony, and witnessing death's arrival to look forward to. But you can still do prophecy. That was how you knew I was coming. In a way... She sighed heavily as if the effort of pulling herself to her red and gold pillow had left her exhausted. As she turned her attention to the board before her, she seemed to shrug off her weariness. I want to show you something. She was speaking now like a confidant. It may finally explain some things for you. He leaned forward expectantly, pleased that she had at last wisely decided to reveal secrets. Oba liked to learn new things. He watched as she sorted through her little pile of stones. She inspected several carefully before she found the one she wanted. She set the others to the side, apparently in some order she understood, though he thought they all looked the same. She turned back to him and lifted the single stone up before his eyes. You, she said. Me? What do you mean? This stone represents you. Why? It chose to. You mean that you decided it would represent me? No, I mean that the stone decided to represent you, or rather, that which controls the stones decided. What controls the stones? He was surprised to see a smile spread on Althea's face. It grew to a dangerous grin. Not even Lethea had ever managed a look as chillingly malevolent. Magic decides, she hissed. Oba had to remind himself that he was invincible. He gestured, trying to look unconcerned. What about the others? Who are they, then? I thought you wanted to learn about yourself, not others. She leaned toward him with a countenance of supreme self-confidence. Other people don't really matter to you, now do they? Oba glared at her private smile. I guess not. She rattled the single stone in her loose fist. Without looking away from his eyes, she cast the stone down at the board. Lightning flickered. The stone tumbled across the board, rolling to a stop out beyond the outer gilded circle. Thunder rumbled in the distance. So, he asked, what does it mean? Rather than answer, and without looking down, she scooped up the stone. Her gaze didn't move off his face as she rattled his stone again. Again, and without a word, she cast it at the board. Lightning flashed. Amazingly, the stone came to rest in the same place as it had the first time. Not just close to the same place, but in the exact same place. Rain drummed against the roof as a stutter of thunder crackled through the swamp. Althea quickly swept up the stone and cast it a third time, again accompanied by a flash of lightning, only this time the lightning was closer. Oba licked his lips as he waited for the fall of the stone that represented him. Goosebumps ran up his arms as he saw the dark little stone roll to a stop in the same place on the board as it had the two previous times. The instant it had halted, thunder boomed. Oba put his hands on his knees and leaned back. Some trick. Not a trick, she said. Magic. I thought you couldn't do magic. I can't. Then how are you doing that? I told you I'm not doing it. The stones are doing it themselves. Well, then what's it supposed to mean about me when it stops there in that place? He realized that somewhere during the stone rolling, her smile had gone away. One graceful finger lit by the firelight, pointed down to where his stone lay. That place represents the underworld, she said in a grim voice. The world of the dead. Oba tried to look only mildly interested. What does that have to do with me? Her big dark eyes wouldn't stop boring into his soul. That's where the voice comes from, Oba. Goosebumps flitted up his arms. How do you know my name? She cocked her head, casting half her face in deep shadow. I made a mistake once long ago. What mistake? I helped save your life, helped your mother get you away from the palace before Dark and Rall could find out that you existed and kill you. Liar! Oba snatched up the stone from the board. I'm his son. Why would he want to kill me? 
she hadn't taken her penetrating gaze from him. Maybe because he knew you would listen to the voices, Oba. Oba wanted to cut out her terrible eyes. He would cut them out. He thought it best, though, if he found out more first, if he gathered his courage first. You were a friend of my mother. No, I didn't really know her. Lethea knew her better. Your mother was but one young woman among several who were in trouble and a great deal of danger. I helped them, that's all. For that, Dark and Rall crippled me. If you choose not to believe the truth about his intentions toward you, then I leave it to you to please yourself with a different answer of your own devising. Oba considered her words, checking them for any connection they might have to anything on his lists. He didn't find any links right off. You and Lethea helped the children of Dark and Rall. My sister Lethea and I were at one time very close. We were both committed, each in our own way, to helping those in need. But she came to resent those like you, offspring of Lord Rall, because of the agony it caused me to have tried to help. She could not bring herself to witness my punishment and pain. She left. It was a weakness on her part, but I knew she could not help having such feelings. I loved her, so I would not beg her to visit me here like this, despite how terribly I missed her. I never saw her again. It was the only kindness I could do her, let her run away. I would imagine she did not look kindly upon you. She had her reasons, even if they were misdirected. Oba was not about to be talked into any sympathy for that hateful woman. He inspected the dark stone for a time, and then gave it back to Althea. Those three were just luck. Do it again. You wouldn't believe me if I did it a hundred times. She handed the stone back. You do it. Cast it yourself. Oba defiantly rattled the stone in his loose fist as he had seen her do. She leaned back against her chair as she watched him. Her eyes were getting droopy. Oba threw the stone down at the board with enough force to be certain that it would roll well beyond the board and prove her wrong. As the stone left his hand, lightning flashed so hard that he flinched and looked up, fearing it was blasting through the roof. Thunder crashed on its heels, shaking the house. The strike felt like it rattled his bones, but then it was over, and the only sound was the rain drumming against the undamaged roof and windows. Oba grinned in relief, and looked down only to see the cursed stone sitting in the exact same place it had come to rest the three times before. He jumped up as if he'd been bitten by a snake. He rubbed his sweating palms against his thighs. A trick, he said. It's just a trick. You're a sorceress, and you're just doing magic tricks. You are the one who has done the trick, Oba. You are the one who invited his darkness into your soul. And what if I have? She smiled at his admission. You may listen to the voice, Oba, but you are not the one. You are merely his servant, no more. He must choose another if he is to bring darkness upon the world. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, but I do. You may be a hole in the world, but you are missing a necessary ingredient. And what would that be? Grushdeva. Oba felt the hair at the back of his neck stiffen. While he didn't recognize the specific word, the source was indisputable. The idiosyncratic nature of the word belonged solely to the voice. A senseless word, it means nothing. She regarded him for a time with a look that he feared, because it seemed to hold a world of forbidden knowledge. By the cast of iron resolve in her eyes, he knew that no mere blade would gain that knowledge for him. A long time ago in a faraway place, she said in her quiet voice, another sorceress revealed to me a bit of the keeper's tongue. That is one of his words in his primordial language. You would not have heard it unless you were the right one. Grushdeva, it means vengeance. You are not the one he has chosen. Oba thought she might be taunting him. You don't know what words I've heard or anything about it. I'm the son of Dark and Rall, a rightful heir. You don't know anything about what I hear. I will have power you can only imagine. Free will is forfeit when dealing with the Keeper. You have sold what is yours alone and priceless for nothing but ashes. You have sold yourself into the worst kind of slavery, Oba, in return for nothing more than the illusion of self-worth. You have no say in what is to be. You are not the one. It is another. She wiped the sweat from her brow. And that much of it is yet to be decided. Now you presume to think you can alter the course of what I have wrought, dictate what shall be? Oba's own words surprised him. 
they'd seem to come out before he thought to say them. Such things are not amenable to the likes of me, she admitted. I learned at the palace of the prophets not to meddle in that which is above me and ungovernable. The grand scheme of life and death are the rightful province of the creator and the keeper. She seemed contented behind a sly expression. But I am not above exercising my free will. He'd heard enough. She was only trying to stall, to confuse him. For some reason, he couldn't make his racing heart slow. What are holes in the world? They are the end of the likes of me, she said. They are the end of everything I know. It was just like a sorceress to answer with a senseless riddle. Who are the other stones, he demanded. At last, she turned her formidable eyes from him to look down at the other stones. Her movement seemed oddly jerky. Her slender fingers selected one of the stones. As she lifted it, she paused to put her other hand across her middle. Oba realized that she was in pain. She was trying her best to cover it, but she couldn't cover it now. The sweat beading her brow was from pain. The agony came out in a low moan. Oba watched with fascination. Then it seemed to ebb some. With great effort, she straightened her posture and returned her attention to what she had been doing. She held out her hand, palm up, with the stone sitting in the center. This one, she said, her breathing labored now, is me. You? That stone is you? She nodded as she cast it at the board without even looking. The stone tumbled to a stop, this time without the accompaniment of lightning and thunder. Oba felt relieved, even a little foolish, that he had been so rattled by that before. He smiled now. It was just a silly board game, and he was invincible. The stone had come to rest at one corner of the square that lay within the two circles. He gestured. So what does that mean? Protector, she managed through a shallow pant. Her trembling fingers gathered up the stone. She lifted her hand up before him and opened her slender fingers. The stone, her stone, rested in the center of her palm. Her eyes were fixed on his. As Oba watched, the stone crumbled to ash in her palm. Why did it do that, he whispered, his eyes going wide. Althea didn't answer. Instead, she slumped and then toppled over. Her arms sprawled out before her, her legs to the side, the ash that had been a stone scattered in a dark smear across the floor. Oba leaped to his feet. His goosebumps were back. He had seen enough people die to know that Althea was dead. Rending slashes of thunderous lightning ignited, lacing the sky with violent flashes of light that lanced in through the windows, throwing blinding white light across the dead sorceress. Sweat trickled down his temple and over his cheek. Oba stood staring at the body for a long moment, and then he ran. Chapter 38 Panting and nearly spent from the effort, Oba stumbled out of the thick vegetation into the meadow. He squinted around in the sudden bright light. He was spooked, hungry, thirsty, weary, and in a mood to tear the little thief limb from limb. The meadow was empty. Clovis! His roar came back to him in an empty echo. Clovis, where are you? Only the moan of the wind between the towering rock walls answered. Oba wondered if the thief might be nervous, might be reluctant to come out, worried that Oba might have discovered his fortune missing and suspect the truth of what happened. Clovis, come here, we need to leave. I must get back to the palace at once. Clovis! Oba waited, his chest heaving, listening for an answer. With fists at his sides, he again bellowed the little thief's name into the cold afternoon air. When no answer came, he fell to his knees beside the fire Clovis had started that morning. He thrust his fingers into the powdery gray ash. It hadn't rained up in the meadow, but the ashes were ice cold. Oba stood, staring up the narrow defile through which they had ridden in early that morning. The cold breeze blowing across the empty meadow ruffled his hair. With both hands, Oba ran his fingers back through his hair, almost as if to keep his head from bursting as the awful truth settled in. He realized that Clovis had not buried the money purse he'd stolen. That had never been his plan. He'd taken the money and run as soon as Oba had gone down into the swamp. He'd run with Oba's fortune, not buried it. With a sick, empty, sinking feeling, Oba understood then the full extent of what had really happened. No one ever went in the swamp by this back way. 
Clovis had talked him into it and guided him there because he believed Oba would perish in the treacherous swamp. Clovis had been confident that Oba would become lost and the swamp would swallow him if the monsters supposedly guarding Althea's back didn't snare him first. Clovis had felt no need to bury the money. He figured Oba was dead, Clovis was gone, and he had Oba's fortune. But Oba was invincible. He had survived the swamp, he had bested the snake, no monsters had dared come out to challenge him after that. Clovis had probably thought that even if the swamp didn't finish his benefactor, there were two other mortal dangers he could count on. Althea hadn't invited Oba in. Clovis had probably figured that she would not take kindly to uninvited guests. Sorceresses rarely did. And they had deadly reputations. But Clovis had not anticipated Oba being invincible. That left the thief only one safeguard against Oba's wrath, and that one was a problem. The Azrith Plains. Oba was stranded in a desolate place. He had no food. Water was nearby, but he had no means to take it with him. He had no horse. He had even left his wool jacket unnecessary in a swamp with the underhanded little hawker. Walking out of this place without supplies exposed to winter's weather would finish anyone who had somehow managed to survive the swamp and Althea. Oba couldn't make his feet move. He knew that, given his situation, if he struck out and tried to walk back, he would die. Despite the cold, he could feel sweat running down his neck. His head was pounding. Oba turned and stared back down into the swamp. There would be things back at Althea's house, food, clothing, and surely something in which he could carry water. Oba had spent his life making do. He could make a pack, at least a pack good enough to get him back to the palace. He could put together a supply of food from the sorceress's house. She wouldn't be there alone and crippled without food on hand. Her husband would be back, but maybe not for days. He would have left food. Oba could wear layers of clothes to keep himself warm enough to make the trek across the bitterly cold plains. Althea said her husband went to the palace. He would have warm clothes to cross the Azrith plains and might have left extra clothes at the house. Even if they didn't fit, Oba could make do. There would be blankets he could take in a pack and wear as a cloak. There was always the possibility, though, that the husband might come back sooner. By the lack of a trail on this side, he would most likely come in the wide path from the other side of the swamp. He could already be there and have discovered his wife's body. Oba wasn't really concerned about that, though. He could deal with the nuisance of a grieving husband. Maybe the man would even be pleased to be out from under the obligation of having to care for a petulant, crippled wife. What good was she anyway? The man should be glad to be rid of her. He might offer Oba a drink to help him celebrate his liberation. Oba didn't feel like celebrating, though. Althea had pulled some evil trick and denied him the pleasure he had so looked forward to, the pleasure he deserved after his long and difficult journey. Oba sighed at how trying sorceresses could be. At least she could provide him with what he needed in order to get back to his ancestral home. But when he got back to the people's palace, he would have no money unless he could find Clovis. Oba knew that was a thin hope. Clovis had Oba's hard-earned fortune now and might well have decided to travel to fine places wantonly spending his ill-gotten gain, the little thief was likely to be long gone. Oba didn't have a copper penny. How was he to survive? He couldn't go back to that pauper's life, a life like the one he had had with his mother, not now, not after he had discovered that he was a Rahl, almost royalty. He couldn't go back to his old life. He wouldn't. Simmering with anger, Oba plunged back down the spine of rock. It was getting late in the day. He had no time to waste. Oba didn't touch the corpse. He wasn't at all queasy about the dead. Quite the contrary, the dead fascinated him. He had spent a great deal of time with dead bodies. But this woman gave him the shivers. Even dead, she seemed to watch him as he searched her house, throwing clothes and supplies in a pile in the center of the room. There was something profane, sinful, about the woman sprawled on the floor. Even the flies buzzing around the room didn't light on her. Lathea had been troublesome, but this woman was different. Althea had pulled some evil trick and denied him the answers he deserved after his long and difficult journey. Oba fumed at how trying sorceresses could be. At least she could provide him with what he needed in order to get back to his ancestral home. There was something unholy about this woman. She had been able to look right into him. 
Lathea had never been able to do that. Of course, he had once thought she could, but she couldn't. Not really. This woman could. She could see the voice in him. Oba wasn't sure if he was safe around her, even if she was dead. Since he was invincible, it was probably only his fertile imagination he knew, but a person couldn't be too cautious. In the bedroom, he found warm wool shirts. They were not nearly large enough, but by ripping out some of the seams, a little here, a little there, he could get them on. Once he was satisfied with his alterations, he threw the item of clothing on the pile. They would be good enough to keep him warm. He added blankets and shirts to the pile in the center of the main room. Annoyed that the tardy husband hadn't returned, and to distract his mind from the smug dead woman who just lay there watching him work, Oba laid plans to kill someone before he went crazy. Maybe a catty woman, one who had those vicious scowl lines around her eyes like his mother had. He needed to make someone pay for all the trouble he had been through. It wasn't fair. It wasn't. It was already dark outside. He had to light an oil lamp in order to continue his search. Oba was in luck. In a lower cupboard, he found a water skin. On his hands and knees, he rummaged through a collection of odd scraps of cloth, cups with cracks, broken cooking tools, and a supply of wax and wick. From the back, he pulled out a small roll of canvas. He tested its strength and decided he could stitch a pack from it. There was material from clothes around he could use to make straps. A sewing kit was handy enough on a low shelf nearby. He had noticed that such useful things were on low shelves where the crippled sorceress with the evil eyes could get to them. A sorceress without magic. Not likely. She was jealous because the voice chose him and not her. She was up to something. He knew it would take him some time to collect everything and stitch together a pack for his supplies. He couldn't leave at night. It would be impossible to make it out through the swamp at night. He was invincible, not stupid. With the oil lamp close by, he sat at the workbench and started in on sewing himself a pack. Althea watched him from the floor in the main room. She was a sorceress, so he knew it would do no good to throw a blanket over her head. If she could watch him all the way from the world of the dead, a mere blanket wasn't going to blind her dead eyes. He would just have to be satisfied to have her watch while he worked. When he had the pack finished and tested to his satisfaction, he set it on the bench and started packing it with food and clothing. She had dried fruit and jerky along with sausages and cheese. There were biscuits that would be easy enough to carry. He didn't bother with pots or food that had to be cooked because he knew there was nothing on the Azrith plains from which to build a fire, and he certainly wasn't going to be able to lug firewood along. He'd travel light and swiftly. He hoped it would only take him a few days to reach the palace. What he would do once he reached the palace, how he would survive without money, he didn't know. He briefly considered stealing it, but rejected the idea. He wasn't a thief and wouldn't lower himself to being a criminal. He wasn't sure how he would get by at the palace. He only knew he had to get there. When he had finished putting together what he would take, his eyes were drooping and he was yawning every few minutes. He was sweating from all his work and from the heat of the foul swamp. Even at night, the place was miserable. He didn't know how the know-it-all sorceress could stand to live in such a place. No wonder her husband went off to the palace. The man was probably downing ales and moaning to his chums about having to go back to his swamp wife. Oba didn't like the idea of sleeping in the same house with the sorceress, but she was dead after all. He still didn't trust her, though. She might be up to some trick. He yawned again and wiped sweat from his brow. There were two well-stuffed sleeping pallets close together on the floor in the bedroom. One was neatly made, the other was less orderly. Judging from the tidy workbench, the neatly made bed was likely the husband's and the other Althea's. Since she was dead on the floor way in the other room, he didn't feel quite so uneasy about sleeping on a nice soft pallet. The husband wasn't going to be coming home in the dark, so Oba wasn't worried about waking to a madman at his throat. Still, he thought it best if he wedged a chair against the door lever before he retired for the night. With the house all secured, he yawned, ready for bed. On his way by, Oba gave Althea the cold shoulder. Oba fell right off to sleep, but it was a fitful slumber. Dreams haunted him. It was hot in the swamp house. Since it was winter everywhere else, he hadn't gotten accustomed to such sudden, sultry heat. Outside, bugs kept up a steady buzzing while night animals hooted and called. Oba tossed and turned, trying to get away from the sorceress's haunting gaze and knowing smile. They seemed to follow him no matter which way he turned, watching him, not letting him sleep soundly. 
he woke for good just after it had begun to get light out. He was in Althea's bed. In a rush to untangle himself from the covers and escape her bed, he rolled over onto his hands and knees. His weight abruptly pushed his hand through the stuffed bedding. In wild alarm, Oba threw back the bedding and overturned the pallet to see what vile trick she had planted for him. She had known he was coming to see her. She was up to something. Under where her pallet had been resting, he saw that a floorboard was loose. That was all it was, a floorboard that had pivoted. Oba frowned in suspicion. A close inspection revealed that the plank had pins in the middle, so it would seesaw. With one careful finger, he pushed the sunken end farther down. The other end of the board rose up. A compartment under the board contained a wooden box. He lifted out the box and tried to open it, but it was locked somehow. There was no hole for a key and no readily apparent lid, so there was probably some trick to opening it. It was heavy. When he shook it, it made only a muffled sound from inside. It might have simply been a weighted weapon the crippled woman kept under her bed in case she was attacked in the night by a snake or something. With the box in his meaty hand, Oba shuffled to the workbench. He sat on the stool and leaned close. As he selected a chisel and mallet, he noticed that the sorceress was still on the floor in the other room, watching. What's in the box? he called to her. Of course she didn't answer. She had no intention of being cooperative. If she had been cooperative, she would have answered all his questions instead of dropping dead after performing her stone-to-ash trick. It gave him shivers just remembering it. Something about the entire encounter had been more than he wanted to contemplate. Oba used the chisel to pry on the box. He tested every joint, but it wouldn't open. He hammered on it with the mallet, but he only succeeded in breaking the mallet's handle. He sighed, deciding that it was probably just a weighted weapon Althea kept for defense. He rose from the bench to go gather his supplies and check that he had everything. He'd had enough of the odd goings-on and the puzzling things she'd left. He needed to be on his way. Oba paused then and turned back at some inner urging. If the heavy box was a weapon, she would have kept it easily at hand. Something about this box was important, or it wouldn't be hidden under a floorboard. Something inside told him so. Resolving to get into the box, he sat again at the bench and selected a narrower chisel and another mallet. He worked the sharp blade between a lengthwise joint near the edge. Sweat dripping off the end of his nose, he grunted with the effort of whacking at the end of the chisel handle, trying to open the joint to see if it was just lead weight inside. All of a sudden, wood split with a loud snap, and the box broke open. Gold and silver coins spilled out like guts from a carp. Oba stood staring at the glut of gold heaped on the bench. The box hadn't rattled only because it had been packed full. There was a fortune, a real fortune. Well, wasn't that just something? There had to be twenty times as much gold as the little weasel Clovis had stolen from him. Oba had thought that poverty had been inflicted upon him by the cowardly little thief, and it turned out he was richer than ever richer even than his wildest dreams. He truly was invincible. He had suffered through adversity and misfortune that would have defeated a lesser man, and fate had justly rewarded him for all his struggles. He knew that this could be nothing other than divine direction. Oba smiled across the room at the woman who lay there watching his triumph. In the drawers of the bench, he found tools kept in pouches. There were three nice leather pouches containing finely crafted beading planes. The leather pouches were probably used to keep the sharp edges on the blades from being dinged and dulled. A cloth pouch held a set of dividers. Another pouch held rosin, while still others held various odd tools. The husband was exceptionally orderly. Life with his swamp wife had probably driven him mad. Oba wiped sweat from his eyes and then scooped all the coins together in the center of the bench. He divided them up into equal piles, carefully counting each pile out so he would know exactly how much money he had earned. Finished counting, he filled the leather and cloth pouches, putting one in each pocket. For safety's sake, he tied each pouch with two thongs going in different directions to different belt loops. He tied a smaller purse around each leg, letting them rest inside the tops of his boots. He opened his trousers and secured several of the heaviest purses inside, where no one could get to them. He reminded himself that he would have to be cautious of passionate ladies with friendly hands, lest they come up with more than he wished to give them. 
Oba had learned his lesson. From now on, he wouldn't keep his fortune altogether. A man as wealthy as he had to protect his holdings. The world was full of thieves. Chapter 39 Oba trudged at last into the outer fringes of the open-air market. After the isolation of the barren plains, the raucous swirl of activity was disorienting. Ordinarily, he would be intrigued by all the goings-on, but this time he paid little heed. He had learned before that rooms could be rented up in the palace. That was what he wanted, to get up into the people's palace and get himself a proper room, one that was quiet. After some good food and rest to recover his strength, he would buy some new clothes and then have a look around. But now, he only wanted the quiet room and the rest. For some reason, the thought of food sickened him. It seemed somewhat inappropriate to him that a Rawl should lower himself to renting a room in his own ancestral home, but he would have to deal with that matter later. Now, he just wanted to lie down. His head was pounding. His eyes hurt every time he turned them to look at something, so, as he plodded along with his head hanging, he tried to limit his focus to the patch of dusty ground immediately before his feet. He had made the long journey from the miserable swamp to the palace by sheer force of will. Despite the cold, he was sweating. He probably had been too wary of the cold weather he would encounter crossing the Azrith Plains, and, with all the shirts he was wearing, had overdressed for it. After all, with spring getting closer, it wasn't as cold as it had been in the depths of winter when his lunatic mother had saddled him with the humiliating task of chipping away at mounds of frozen muck. Oba dug at a wad of cloth, bunching uncomfortably under his armpit. The shirts had been too small for him, so he had had to rip out seams here and there to get them all on. Some of the sleeves had come apart on his long trek across the windswept plain and had ridden up his arm under the outer layers that now hung like tattered flags. His canvas pack, made in such haste, was coming apart too, so that the corners of the dark wool blanket hung down, flapping behind him as he walked. With all the different colors of cloth showing through the various torn layers and the brown woolen blanket he wore as a cloak, he mused that he must look like a beggar. He was probably wealthy enough to buy the entire market a dozen times over. He would buy some fine clothes later. First, he needed a quiet room and a good long rest. No food, though. He definitely didn't feel like eating anything. He ached all over. Even blinking was painful, but it was his gut that was in particular agony. When he had been here before, the savory aromas of cooking had made his mouth water. Now the tendrils of smoke from cooking fires nauseated him. He wondered if it was because he had more refined tastes now. He thought that maybe if he went up into the palace, he could get himself something mild to eat. The thought failed to rally his appetite. He wasn't hungry, just tired. Eyes drooping, Oba slogged onward through the makeshift streets of the open-air market. He aimed himself at the plateau, towering over them. The pack on his back felt as if it weighed as much as three good-sized men, probably some trick of the swamp witch, some spell she had cast. Knowing he was on his way to her place, she had probably put some magic lead weights in her sausages. The thought of sausages made his stomach royal. Peering up at the palace, shining in the sunlight far overhead as he walked, he accidentally blundered into someone, driving a grunt from their lungs. Oba was just about to kick the annoying obstacle out of his path when the hunched bundle of rags wheeled to growl a curse. It was Clovis. Before Oba could snatch him, Clovis scrambled out from underfoot and dove between two older men passing by. Oba, right behind him, but being wider, knocked the men aside. As the two men fell, Oba staggered through, fighting to keep his balance, and went for the little thief. Clovis skidded to a stop. He looked left, then right. Seeing his chance, Oba lunged for the thief, draped with tattered clothes, but the slight man was able to cut down another street just in time to slip out of Oba's reaching arms. Oba fell short, capturing only a face full of dirt and a small flag of cloth from the man's sleeve. As Oba clambered to his feet, he saw Clovis leap over a fire to the side where people were cooking strips of meat skewered on sticks and run back between picketed horses. For such a stooped fellow, he could run like smoke in a gale. But Oba was big and strong and quick. Oba had always prided himself on being light on his feet. He cleared the cook fire with room to spare and ran back between the horses, trying not to lose sight of his prey. The horses spooked at having men racing recklessly between them. Several panicked animals reared, pulling up lines and bolted. The man watching them, yelling curses and oaths Oba didn't really hear or care about, jumped out in front of him. 
His attention fixed on the man he was chasing, Oba clouted the irate fellow out of the way. More horses reared. Without pausing, Oba careered after the thief. Oba didn't really need his money back. He had a fortune now. He had more money than he could probably ever spend, even if he was only halfway careful. But this was not about money. This was about a crime, a betrayal. Oba had paid the man, trusted him, and he had been cheated for it. Worse, he had been played for a fool. His mother always told him that he was a fool. Oba the Oaf, she always called him. Oba wasn't going to allow anyone to make a fool of him anymore. He wasn't going to allow his smug mother to be proven right. That Oba had triumphed and come out of the swamp richer than ever was no thanks to Clovis. No, it was thanks only to Oba himself. Just when he thought he was a pauper again, he managed to find the secret to a fortune that was, after all, due him for any number of reasons, the least of which was his long and difficult journey to see Althea, only to have her, too, cheat him out of answers for no more reason than out-and-out -out meanness. Clovis had plotted it all out and left him for dead. His intention had been to kill him. The fact that Oba had survived was no thanks to Clovis. The man was a murderer, when you thought about it, a killer. The people of Dahara would owe Oba Rahl a debt of gratitude after he dealt out swift and just retribution to the wicked little outlaw. Clovis darted around a corner stand, displaying hundreds of items made from sheep's horn. Oba, being heavier, shot past the corner, and as he tried to turn, he slipped on horse manure. Through mighty effort and sheer skill, he managed to keep his balance and remain upright. Oba had spent years in such slop, carrying heavy loads, tending animals, and running when his mother yelled for him. He had had to do it in all kinds of conditions, too, including icy weather. In a way, all those years of effort had been practice that had prepared Oba for making the corner when no other man his size and weight would have stood a chance. He made it, and in a smooth and swift fashion that was shocking to the thief. As Clovis glanced back with a mocking grin, apparently expecting that Oba was down for sure, he looked stunned to see instead Oba's full weight bearing down on him at full speed. Clovis, obviously spurred on by the terror of knowing justice itself was descending on him, darted down another of the makeshift streets, a smaller and less peopled byway. But this time, Oba was right there behind him. He snatched the flapping rags at a shoulder, spinning Clovis around. The man stumbled. His arms windmilled awkwardly as he tried to keep his footing and escape at the same time. Clovis's eyes went wide, first from surprise and then from the pressure of the hand that had clamped around his throat. Whatever sort of squeal or plea was trying to make its way out didn't get past Oba's vice-like fingers. Fatigue forgotten, Oba dragged the murderous little thief kicking and twisting back between two wagons. The wagon's canvas tops shaded the narrow space between. To the rear of the tight space was a tall wall of crates. Oba's back blocked the constricted opening between the wagon beds, closing off the cramped spot from view as effectively as a prison door. Oba could hear people behind him going about their business, laughing and talking as they hurried by in the brisk air. Others, in the distance, argued and bargained with merchants over the price of goods. Horses clopped past, their tack jangling. Peddlers plied the streets, calling out the benefits of their wares in a high-pitched sing-song, trying to entice buyers. Only Clovis was silent, but not by choice. The hawker's lying little mouth opened wide, trying to say something. But as Oba lifted him clear of the ground and the man's eyes rolled from side to side, it was clearly a scream for help trying unsuccessfully to escape. With his feet kicking only air, Clovis pried at the powerful fingers around his neck. His dirty fingernails broke backward as he clawed in desperation at the iron fist of justice. His eyes grew as big around as the gold marks he had stolen from Oba. Holding him aloft with one hand, pressing him against one of the heavy wooden crates in the back, Oba searched the man's pockets, but found nothing. Clovis desperately pointed at his chest. Oba felt a lump under the tattered layers of rags and shirt. Ripping the shirt open, he saw his familiar fat purse hanging by a leather thong around the thief's neck. A mighty pull burned the thong down into the man's flesh until the leather snapped. Oba slipped his pouch safely back into a pocket. Clovis tried to smile to make an apologetic face, as if to say that everything was square now. Oba was long past forgiveness. His head pounded with rage unleashed. Holding Clovis's shoulders up against the heavy wooden crates, Oba rammed his fist up into the little man's gut. Clovis was turning purple. Oba threw a heavy punch into the dirty little face. He felt bone break. 
He whipped his elbow around and into the lying, conniving little mouth and broke all the front teeth out. Oba growled as he walloped the little weasel with three more rapid blows. With each blow, Clovis's head snapped back, his greasy hair throwing back blood each time the back of his skull whacked the crates. Oba was furious. He had suffered the indignity of being a helpless victim of a thief who had left him for dead. He had been attacked by a giant snake. He had nearly been drowned. He had been taunted and tricked by Althea. She had looked into his soul without his permission. She had cheated him out of his answers, belittled him for making something of himself, and died before he could kill her besides. He had suffered through a long march across the Azrith plains dressed in rags. He, overall, practically royalty. The utter indignity was humiliating. He was enraged and aptly so. He could hardly believe that he finally had the object of that rightful anger at hand. He would not be denied just retribution. Holding Clovis down on the ground with a knee pressed to the man's chest, Oba at last let the full and rightful rage of vengeance free. He didn't feel the blows any more than he felt the aches and pains he had come down with. He cursed the murderous little thief as he dealt out justice, turning Clovis to a bloody pulp. Copious sweat poured down Oba's face. He gasped for air as he slugged away. His arms felt like lead. As he became worn out, he felt his head pounding as hard as his fists. He had trouble focusing on the target of his anger. The ground was soaked with blood. What had been Clovis was no longer remotely recognizable. His jaw was shattered and hung completely unhinged to the side. One eye socket had been altogether caved in. Oba's knee had broken the man's sternum and crushed his chest. It was glorious. Oba felt hands snatching his clothes and arms, pulling him back. He didn't have the strength left to try to stand. As he was dragged backward from between the wagons, he saw a crowd of people formed in a half circle, all stricken with horror. Oba was pleased by that, because it meant that Clovis had gotten what he deserved. Proper punishment for crimes should horrify people, so as to serve as an example. That's what his father would have said. Oba looked up, closer, at the men hauling him out from between the wagons. A wall of leather armor, chain mail, and steel had poured in to surround him. Pikes and swords and axes glinted in the sunlight. They were all pointing at him. He could only blink, too drained to lift a hand to wave them away. Exhausted, out of breath, and soaked in sweat, Oba couldn't hold his head up. As he started to sag in the arms of the men holding him, blackness enveloped him. Chapter 40 In a somber daze, Friedrich used the shovel to steady himself as he sank to his knees. Sitting back on his heels, he let the shovel topple to the cold ground. The chill wind ruffled his hair as well as the long grasses around the freshly turned soil. His world was ashes. Dazed with grief, his mind wouldn't focus on any other thought. A sob overwhelmed him. He worried that he might not have done the right thing. It was cold here. He worried that Althea would be cold. Friedrich didn't want her to be cold. But it was sunny, too. Althea loved sunlight. She always said that she liked the feel of the sun on her face. Despite the heat in the swamp, the sunlight rarely made it down to the ground, at least anywhere near where she could see it from her confinement. To Friedrich, though... Her hair was golden sunlight. She would always scoff at such sentiment, but occasionally, if he hadn't mentioned it in a while, she would innocently ask if he thought her hair was brushed enough and looked all right for visitors due for a telling. She always could keep her face blameless when she was angling for what she wanted. Then he would tell her that her hair looked like sunshine. She would blush like an adolescent girl and say, Oh, Friedrich. Now the sun would never shine for him again. He had considered what to do, and had decided this would be better for her, to be up here in the meadow out of the swamp. If he could never take her out of that place in life, at least he could take her out now. The sunny meadow was a better place to lay her to rest than in her former prison. He would have given anything to have taken her out before, to show her beautiful places again, to see her smile carefree in the sunlight, but she could not leave. For everyone else, including him, only the path in the front could be safely traversed. There was no other way past the dark things created of her power. For her, there was not even that safe passage. Friedrich knew that the dire consequences for anyone who ventured anywhere else in the swamp were not imaginary. 
Several times over the years, the unwary or the foolhardy had wandered off the path or tried to make it through the back way, where not even he dared go. It had been torturous for Althea, knowing that her power had ended innocent lives. How Jensen had made it in the back way unharmed, not even Althea knew. For her last journey, Friedrich had carried Althea out that back way as a symbol of her freedom reclaimed. Her monsters were gone. She was with the good spirits now. Now he was alone. Friedrich bent forward in agony, sobbing over her fresh grave. The world was suddenly an empty, lonely, dead place. His fingers clutched at the cold ground covering his love. He felt crushing guilt that he had not been there to protect her. He was sure that if he had been there, she would still be alive. That was all he wanted, Althea alive, Althea back, Althea with him. He had always delighted in returning home, such as it was, to tell her about any little thing he had seen. A bird skimming over a field, a tree with its leaves shimmering in the sunlight, a road lying like a ribbon over rolling hills, anything that would have brought a little of the world home to her in her prison. In the beginning, he hadn't talked about the world beyond. He thought that if he told her about the things he had seen outside her swamp, about what was suddenly out of her reach, she would only feel more confined more isolated, more heartsick. Althea smiled that special smile of hers and said that she wanted to hear every detail of what he saw because in that way she could deny Dark and Rawl his wish to confine her. She said that Friedrich was her eyes and through them she could escape her prison. With the descriptions Friedrich brought her, Althea's mind soared up and away from her confinement. In that way, Friedrich helped her deny that vile man his wish that she should never again see the world. To that extent, Friedrich could feel good about leaving the swamp when she had to remain behind. He wasn't sure who was giving who the gift. Althea was like that, making him think he was doing something for her when it was she who was really helping him live his life in the best way he could. Now, Friedrich didn't know what he would do. His life seemed suspended. He had no life without Althea. She was a presence that had given him life, given him himself, made him whole. Without her in his life, life was pointless. How her life had ended, Friedrich didn't know for sure. The things he'd found made little sense to him. She hadn't been touched, but the house had been ransacked. The strangest things had been taken. Their entire lifetime of savings, along with food, a few odd supplies, and old clothing of little worth. Yet other valuable items were left, gilded carvings, gold leaf and tools, Try as he might, Friedrich could make no sense or order out of it. The one thing he did understand was that Althea had poisoned herself. And there had been another cup. She had tried to poison someone else. Maybe someone who had come for a telling, someone who hadn't been invited. Friedrich realized, though, that Althea must have been expecting whoever it was and had kept that knowledge from him, encouraging him to make a trip to the palace to sell his gilded carvings. She had seemed somewhat insistent, and he had thought that, since she had invited no visitors, she must have wanted to be alone for a while, which wasn't entirely unusual. Or perhaps she was just impatient for him to take a little journey out into the world and see some sights, since he hadn't done so in a while. She had held his face in her hands as she kissed him that last time, savoring the feel of him. Now he knew the truth. That long kiss had been her farewell. She had wanted him safely out of the way. Friedrich reached in a pocket and pulled out the note she had left him. She sometimes wrote notes for him, things she thought of while he was away, things she wanted to remember to tell him. He had checked in the gilded cup he had carved for her, which she kept down on the floor under her chair behind the pillow she sat on, and was surprised to find a letter to him. He carefully unfolded it and read it again, even though he had read it so many times that he knew every word by heart. My beloved Friedrich, I know that you can't understand right now, but I want you to know that I have not forsaken my duty to the sanctity of life. Rather, I am fulfilling it. I realize it won't be easy for you, but you must trust me when I say that I had to do this. I am at peace. I have had a long life, longer by far than nearly any other person is fortunate enough to have. But the best of it was the part I lived with you. I have loved you almost since the day you walked into my life and awakened my heart. Do not let grief crush your heart. We will be together in the next world and for all time. But in this world, you, like me, are one of the four protectors, the four stones at the corners on my grace. You remember. 
You asked who they were, and I told you that Lethea and I were two of the stones in my last telling. I wish I could have told you then that you are one as well, but I dared not. I am blind to much of what is happening. But with what I do know, I must do what I can, or the chance for others to live and love would be forever lost. Know that you are always in my heart, and will be even when I cross the veil to be with the good spirits. The world of life needs you, Friedrich. Your part in this has yet to begin. I beg of you that when you are called upon, you will fulfill that purpose. Yours for eternity, Althea. Friedrich wiped the tears from his cheeks, and then read Althea's words again. When he read, he could hear her voice in his head speaking to him, almost as if she were right there beside him. He feared to let go of that voice, but at last he carefully folded the note and returned it to his pocket. When he looked up, a tall man was standing before him. I was an acquaintance of Althea's. His powerful voice was solemn and earnest. I'm terribly sorry for your loss. I came to pay my respects and to offer my sympathy. Friedrich slowly rose to his feet, watching the older man's dark azure eyes. How could you know? How do you know what happened? Friedrich's anger rose, too. What part have you played in this? The part of a sad witness to that which I cannot change. The man, much older but vigorous-looking, laid a hand on Friedrich's shoulder, squeezing in a gentle manner. I knew Althea from long ago when she came to study at the Palace of the Prophets. You didn't answer my question. How did you know? I am Nathan the Prophet. Nathan the Prophet? Nathan Rall? Wizard Rall? The man nodded as he took his hand away, letting his arms slip back under the edge of his open dark brown cape. Friedrich dipped his head out of deference, but couldn't muster the concern to do more, to bow, even if he was in the presence of a wizard, even if this wizard was a Rall. The man wore brown wool trousers and high boots, not the robes of a wizard. For the most part, he didn't look like what Friedrich expected of a wizard, and he looked not at all like a man Althea had said was close to a thousand years old. His strong jaw was clean-shaven. His straight white hair was long enough to touch his broad shoulders. He was not stooped with age, but had the fluid posture of a swordsman, though he wore no sword, and the effortless bearing of authority. His eyes, though, so piercing from under his hawkish brow, were what Friedrich would expect of such a man. They were the eyes of a Rall. Friedrich felt a twinge of jealousy. This man knew Althea long before Friedrich had met her, back when she was young and exquisitely beautiful, a sorceress at the prime of her power and ability, a woman sought after, a woman courted by many a great man, a woman who knew what she wanted and went after it with fierce passion. Friedrich wasn't so naive as to believe he was the first man in her life. I spoke with her briefly a few times, Nathan said, as if in answer to questions unspoken, making Friedrich wonder if a man of this ability could also read minds. She had an exceedingly talented gift for prophecy, at least for a sorceress. Compared, though, to a true prophet, she was but a child trying to play at adult games. The wizard softened his words with a kindly smile. That is not to discount at all her heart or intellect, but merely to put it into perspective. Friedrich looked away from the man's eyes back to the grave. Do you know what happened? When no answer came, he gazed back up at the tall man watching him. And if you knew, could you have stopped her? Nathan considered the question for a moment. Did you ever know Althea to be able to alter that which she saw when she cast her stones? I guess not, Friedrich admitted. A few times he had held her as she wept with the sorrow of wishing she could change something she saw. She had often told him, when he asked about it, or asked what could be done, that such things were not as simple as they seemed to those without the gift. While Friedrich couldn't understand many of the complexities of her ability, he did know that at times the burden of prophecy nearly crushed her with anguish. Do you know why she would have done this? Friedrich asked, hopeful for some explanation that might make the pain more bearable, or who it was that brought her to it. She made the choice of how she would die. Nathan said in simple summation. You must trust that she made that choice of her own free will and for sound reasons. You must understand that what she did was not only done because it was the best for her and for you, but for others as well. Others? What do you mean? You both know what love brings to life. By her choice, she was doing what she could, 
so that others might have their chance to know life and love. I still don't understand. Nathan gazed off distantly as he slowly shook his head. I know only bits of what is happening, Friedrich. In this, I feel blind in a way I have never felt before. You mean this has to do with Jensen? Nathan's brow twitched as his eyes focused abruptly and intently on Friedrich. Jensen? His voice was laced with suspicion. One of the holes in the world. Althea said that Jensen is a daughter of Dark and Rahl. The wizard drew back his cape and propped a hand on his hip. So that was her name. Jensen, his mouth turned up with a private smile. I've never heard that term, hole in the world, but I can see how apt it would seem to a sorceress's restricted gift. He shook his head. Despite her talent, Althea couldn't begin to comprehend what is involved with those like Jensen. The inability of the gifted to recognize aspects of their existence and so referring to them as a hole in the world is but the tail of the bull. The tail is the least important part. Whole is not even really accurate. I should think void would be better. I'm not so sure you're right about her not comprehending. Althea was involved with those like Jensen for a long time. She may have been more aware than you realize. She explained to Jensen and me that she didn't know anymore, but that the most important part was that the gifted were blind to them. Nathan grunted a short chuckle of respect for the woman buried before them. Oh, Althea knew more, much more. This hole in the world business was but window dressing for what Althea knew. Friedrich dared not contradict the wizard, for he knew how sorceresses kept secrets, never revealing the true extent of what they knew. Althea did this too, even to Friedrich. He knew that it wasn't a lack of respect or love, but just the way sorceresses were. He couldn't be offended by what was simply her nature. So there is more about those like Jensen then? Oh, yes. This bull has horns, not just a tail. Nathan sighed. But despite the fact that I understand much of what Althea did not, even I don't begin to know enough to claim to grasp all of what is truly involved in the events beginning to unfold. This part of prophecy is obscured. I know enough, though, to know that this can alter the very nature of existence. You're a Rawl. How could you not know of such things? Page 373. At a very young age, I was taken away to the old world by the Sisters of the Light and imprisoned there in the Palace of the Prophets. I am a Rahl, but in many ways I know little of my ancestral homeland of Dahara. Much of what I know I learned through books of prophecy. Prophecy is silent about those like Jensen. I only recently have begun to discover why and the dire consequences. He clasped his hands behind his back. So this girl, Jensen, came to see Althea... How did she know of Althea? Yes, Jensen was the cause of... Friedrich's gaze fell away from the man watching him, not knowing how he would feel about his kinsman, but then he decided to say it, even if it brought the man's wrath. When Jensen was young, Althea tried to help protect her from Darken Rahl. Darken Rahl crippled Althea for it and imprisoned her in the swamp. He stripped her of her power, except for that of prophecy. I know, Nathan whispered, clearly in sorrow. Although I never knew the causes behind it, I saw some of it foretold. Friedrich took a step forward. Then why would you not help her? This time, it was Nathan's gaze that broke away. Oh, but I did. I was imprisoned there at the Palace of the Prophets when she came to see me. Imprisoned for what? Imprisoned for the unjust fears of others. I am a rarity, a prophet. I am feared as an oddity, as a madman, as a savior, as a destroyer all because I see things others don't. There are times when I cannot help but to try to change what I see. If it's prophecy, how can it be changed? If you changed it, it would be untrue. Then it wouldn't be prophecy. Nathan stared off at the cold sky, the wind lifting his long hair back away from his face. I could never explain it adequately to one such as you, one ungifted, but I can explain a small part of it in this way. There are books of prophecy going back thousands of years. Those books contain events that have not yet happened. In order for free will to exist, there must be questions left open. This is done partly through forked prophecies. Forked prophecies? You mean that events could go one of two ways? Nathan nodded. At the least, often many ways. Key events, anyway. 
The books will often contain a line of prophecy for several outcomes that could result from free will. When a particular fork proves to be the one that actually takes place, one line of prophecy will be true while others at that moment become invalid. Up until then, they were all viable. Had another choice been made, that fork would have turned out to be the valid prophecy. Instead, that branch of prophecy withers and dies even though the book with that line of prophecy remains. Prophecy is thus tangled with the deadwood of ages past, with all the choices not made, the things that never came to be. Friedrich's anger rose again. And so you knew what would happen to Althea? You mean you could have warned her? When she came to me, I told her of a fork. I didn't know when she would reach it, but I knew that death waited down both paths. With the information I gave her, she would be able to know when the time was at hand. I had hoped that somehow she could find a way around what I saw. Sometimes there are shrouded forks that we are unaware of. I was hoping that was the case this time, and she might find it if it existed. Friedrich was incredulous. You could have done something. You might have prevented what happened. Nathan lifted a hand toward the grave. This is the result of trying to change what will be. It does not work. But maybe if... Nathan's hawk-like glare rose in warning. For your own peace of mind, I will tell you this, but no more. Down the other path was a murder so torturous, so bloody, so painful, so violent, that when you discovered what was left of her, you would have ended your own life rather than continue to live with what you had seen. Be thankful that did not happen. It did not happen, not because she feared that death more, but in part because she loved you and didn't want you to suffer that. Nathan gestured to the grave again. She chose this path. This was that fork you told her of then. Nathan's glare softened. Not exactly. The fork she took was that she would die. She chose how. You mean she might have chosen another fork, a path in which she would live? Nathan nodded. For a time, but had she chosen that path, we would all soon be in the keeper's clutches. Because of those involved, I know only that down that path, everything ended. The choice she made was that there would still be a chance. A chance? A chance for what? Nathan sighed. Friedrich suspected that the sigh reflected things more grave, more sweeping than anything Althea had ever seen. Althea bought us all time that others might make the right choices when the time comes for them to act of their free will. This knot of forks in prophecy is obscured unlike any other, but most of the threads lead to nothing. To nothing? I don't understand. What could that mean? Existence is at stake, Nathan's eyebrow lifted. Most of those prophecies end in a void, in the world of the dead, for everything. But you can see the way through? The tangle ahead is a mystery to me. In this I feel helpless. In this I know what it feels like to be ungifted and blind. In this I might as well be. I can't even see all of those who are making the critical choices. It must be Jensen. Maybe if you found her... But Althea said the gifted are blind to the ungifted offspring of Dark and Rahl. Of any Rahl. The gift is of no use in locating such truly ungifted offspring. There is no telling where they are unless you could gather all the people in the entire world and parade them before the gifted, there would be no practical way to detect them with the gift. Physical proximity is the only means for the gift to tell you who they are, because your eyes and your gift don't agree, like when I saw Jensen by accident. You think, then, that Jensen is somehow involved in this? Nathan threw his cape closed against the bitter wind. As far as the prophecies are concerned, those like Jensen don't even exist. I have no way of telling if there are others, and if there are, how many there might be. I have no idea what part any of them play in this. I know only that they somehow play a pivotal role. I know some of what is involved and some of those who will stand at critical forks in prophecy. As I said, though, many of those forks in prophecy are obscured. But you're a prophet, a true prophet, according to Althea. How could you not know what prophecy says if the prophecy exists? Nathan gauged him from behind intent azure eyes. Try to understand what I will tell you. It's a concept that few people can grasp. Perhaps it can help you in your grief, for it is the point at which Althea found herself. Friedrich nodded. Tell me then. 
Prophecy and free will exist in tension. They exist in opposition, yet they interact. Prophecy is magic, and all magic needs balance. The balance to prophecy. The balance that allows prophecy to exist is free will. That makes no sense. They would cancel each other. Ah, but they don't, the prophet said with a sly, knowing smile. They are interdependent, and yet they are antithetical. Just as additive and subtractive magic are opposite forces, they both exist. They each serve to balance the other, creation and destruction, life and death. Magic must have balance to function. Prophecy functions by the presence of its counter, free will. You're a prophet, and you're telling me that free will exists, making prophecy invalid? Does death invalidate life? No. It defines it, and in so doing, creates its value. In the silence, none of it seemed to matter. It was too hard for Friedrich to fathom just then. Besides, it changed nothing for him. Death had come to take Althea's precious life. Her life was all the value he had had. His anguish poured back in to flood everything else. For Friedrich, it had already ended. There was nothing ahead but blackness. I came for another reason, Wizard Rawl said in a quiet voice. I must call upon you to help in this struggle. Too tired to stand any more, too grief-stricken to care, Friedrich sank back to the ground beside Althea's grave. You have come to the wrong person. Do you know where Lord Rahl is? Friedrich looked up, squinting against the bright sky. Lord Rahl? Yes, Lord Rahl. You are Daharan, you should know. I guess I can feel the bond. Friedrich gestured off to the south. He's that way. But it's weak. He must be a great distance. Greater than I've ever felt of a Lord Rahl in all my life. That's right, Nathan said. He's in the old world. You must go to him. Friedrich grunted. I've no money for a journey. It seemed the easiest reason. Nathan tossed down a leather pouch. It hit the ground before Friedrich with a heavy, muffled clunk. I know. I'm a prophet, remember? This is more than was taken from you. Friedrich tested the weight of the bag. It was indeed heavy. Where did all this come from? The palace. This is official business, so Dahara will supply you with the money you will need. Friedrich shook his head. I thank you for coming and offering your sympathy, but I'm the wrong man. Send another. You are the man who is to go. Althea would have known it. She would have left you a letter telling you that you are needed in this struggle. She would have asked you to accept when called upon. Lord Rahl needs you. I am calling upon you. You know of the letter? Friedrich asked as he rose to his feet once more. It's one of the precious few things I know about in this matter. From prophecy, I know you are the one to go. But you must do so of your own free will. I am calling upon you to do so. Friedrich shook his head, this time with more conviction. I'm not the one to do this. You don't understand. I'm afraid that I just don't care anymore. Nathan drew something out from under his cloak. He held it out. Friedrich saw then that it was a small book. Take it, the wizard commanded, his voice suddenly full and rich with authority. Friedrich did so, letting his fingers roam the ancient leather cover as he inspected words embossed with gold leaf. There were four words on the cover, but Friedrich had never seen the language before. This book is from the time of a great war thousands of years ago, Nathan said. I only just discovered it in the people's palace after a frantic search among the thousands of tomes there. As soon as I located it, I rushed here. I haven't had time to translate it, so I don't even know what's written in it. It's all written in a different language. Nathan nodded. Hi, Daharan, a language I helped teach Richard. It's vitally important he get this book. Richard? Lord Rahl. The way he said those two words gave Friedrich a chill. If you've not read it, how do you know it's the right book? By the title there on the front. Friedrich ran his fingers lightly over the mysterious words. The gilding was still good after all this time. May I ask the book's title? The Pillars of Creation. Chapter 41 Oba opened his eyes, but for some reason that didn't seem to help. He couldn't see dismay stiffened him. He was lying on his back on something like rough, cold stone. 
It was a complete mystery to him as to where he could be or how he had gotten there, but his first and most important concern was that he had somehow gone blind. Trembling from head to foot, Oba blinked, trying to clear his vision, but still he could not see. A thought worse by far was what really ignited his panic. He wondered if he was back in the pen. He feared to move and proved the suspicion true. He didn't know how they had done it, but he despaired that those three conniving women, the troublesome sorceress sisters and his lunatic mother, had somehow managed to once again lock him in his dark childhood prison. They had probably been plotting from beyond the grave, and in his sleep they had pounced. Paralyzed by his plight, Oba couldn't gather his wits. But then he heard a noise. He turned his eyes toward the sound and saw movement. He realized as things came into focus that it was only some dark room and not his pen after all. Relief washed through him, followed by chagrin. What had he been thinking? He was Oberall. He was invincible. It would serve him well to remember that. Though he was relieved to know it wasn't what he had at first feared, prudence kept him cautious. The place felt strange and dangerous. He concentrated, trying to recall what had taken place and how he could have come to be in such a cold, dark place. But it wouldn't come to him. His memory was all foggy, just a collection of random impressions, dizzying illness, pounding headache, profound weakness and nausea, being carried, hands everywhere on him, lights hurting his eyes, darkness. He felt battered and bruised. Someone nearby coughed. From another direction, a man grumbled at him to shut up. Oba lay still as a mountain lion, his muscles tensed. He worked at gathering his senses, letting his gaze carefully roam the dark room. It wasn't completely dark, as he had feared at first. On the wall opposite him, a weak light, possibly wavering candlelight, came in through a square opening. There were two dark vertical lines in the opening. Olba's head still pounded, but it was much better than it had been before. He remembered then how sick he had been. Looking back on it, he realized that he hadn't even grasped at the time how truly ill he had been. As a youngster, he'd had a fever once. This had been like that, he supposed, a fever. He had probably gotten it visiting Althea, the awful swamp witch. Oba sat up, but that made him feel lightheaded. So he leaned back against the wall. It was rough stone, like the floor. He rubbed his cold, stiff legs and then stretched his back. He wiped his knuckles across his eyes, trying to banish the lingering haze in his head. He saw rats, whiskers twitching, nosing along the edge of the wall. Oba was starving, despite the rank stench of the place. It smelled of sweat and urine and worse. Look, the big ox is awake, someone across the room said. The voice was deep and mocking. Oba peered up and saw men looking at him. Altogether, there were five others in the room with him. They looked a scruffy lot. The man who had spoken off in the corner to the right was the only other man beside Oba sitting. He leaned back into the corner as if he owned it. His humorless grin showed that what teeth weren't missing were crooked as could be. Oba looked around at the other four men standing watching him. You all look like criminals, he said. Laughter echoed around the room. We're all being wrongly persecuted, the man in the corner said. Yeah, someone else agreed. We were minding our own business when those guards snatched us up and threw us in here for nothing at all. They locked us up like we was common criminals. More laughter rang out. Oba didn't think he liked being in a room with criminals. He knew he didn't like being locked in a room. That felt too much like his pen. A cursory inspection proved his suspicion true. His money was gone. From across the room, under the crack of the door, a rat watched with beady little rat eyes. Oba looked up from the rat to the opening with the light. He saw then that the two lines were bars. Where are we? In the palace prison, you big ox, Crooked Teeth said. Does it look like a proper whorehouse to you? The other men all laughed at his joke. Maybe the kind he visits, one of them said, and the rest laughed all the louder. Over to the side, another rat watched. I'm hungry. When will they feed us? Oba asked. He's hungry, one of the standing men said in a taunting voice. He spat in disgust. They don't feed us unless they feel like it. You might starve first. Another man squatted in front of him. What's your name? Oba. What did you do to get yourself thrown in here, Oba? Rob an old maid of her virginity? The men guffawed with him. Oba didn't think the man was funny. I didn't do anything wrong, he said. He didn't like these men. They were criminals. So you're innocent, eh? 
I don't know why they would put me in here. We heard different, the man squatting before him said. Yeah, the keeper of the corner agreed. We heard the guards talking, saying that you beat a man to death with your bare hands. Oba frowned in true bewilderment. Why would they put me in here for that? The man was a thief. He left me out in a desolate place to die after he'd robbed me. He only got what was coming to him. Says you, Crooked Teeth said. We heard you was probably the one robbing him. What? Oba was incredulous as well as indignant. Who said that? The guards, came the answer. They're lying then, Oba insisted. The men started in laughing again. Clovis was a thief and a murderer. The laughter cut off. Rats stopped and looked up. They sniffed the air, their noses twitching. The keeper of the corner sat up straight. Clovis? Did you say Clovis? You mean the man who sold charms? Oba ground his teeth at the memory. He wished he could pound on Clovis some more. That's the one, Clovis the Hawker. He robbed me and left me for dead. I didn't kill him. I measured out justice. I should be rewarded for it. They can't imprison me for administering justice to Clovis. He deserved it for his crimes. The man in the corner rose up. The other men closed in. Clovis was one of us, Crooked Teeth said. He was a friend of ours. Really, Oba said. Well, I pounded him to a bloody pulp. If I'd have had time, I'd have cut some tender pieces off of him before I mashed his head. Pretty brave for a big fellow when it comes to beating a hunched little man who's all alone, one of the men said under his breath. Another of the men spat at him. Oba's anger sprang to life. He reached for his knife but found it missing. Who took my knife? I want it back. Which one of you thieves stole my knife? The guards took it, Crooked Teeth snickered. You really are a dumb oaf, aren't you? Oba glared up at the man standing in the center of the room, fists at his sides, his crooked teeth making his lips look lumpy. The man's powerful barreled chest rose and fell with each seethed breath. His shaved head made him look to be a troublemaker. He took another step toward Oba. That's what you are, a big oaf. Oba the oaf. The others laughed. Oba simmered as he listened to the voice counseling him. He wanted to cut the tongues out of these men and then go to work on them. Oba preferred doing such things to women, but these men were earning it, too. It would be fun to take his time and watch them squirm, to make them cry, to watch the look in their eyes as death entered their convulsing bodies. As the men closed in around him, Oba remembered that he didn't have his knife, so he couldn't have the kind of fun he would have liked to. He needed to get his knife back. He was tired of this place. He wanted out. Stand up, Oba the Oaf, Crooked Teeth growled. A rat scurried across in front of him. Oba slapped a hand down on its tail. The rat tugged and twisted, but couldn't get away. Oba snatched the furry thing up in his other hand. It wriggled, wrenching this way and that, trying to escape, but Oba had a good grip on it. As he stood, he bit off the rat's head. When he had reached his full height, a good head taller than Crooked Teeth, he glared into the eyes of the men around him. The only sound was bones crunching as Oba chewed the rat's head. The men backed away. Oba, still chewing, went to the door and peered out the barred opening. He saw two guards standing at the intersection of a nearby hall, talking quietly. You there, he called out. There's been a mistake. I need to speak with you. The two men paused in their conversation. Oh, yeah? What's the mistake? One asked. Oba's gaze moved between the two, but it was not just his gaze. The gaze of the thing that was the voice also watched from within him. I am brother to Lord Rall. Oba knew that he was saying aloud what he had never said to a stranger before, but he felt compelled to do so. He was somewhat surprised to hear himself go on as everyone watched him. I am falsely imprisoned for measuring out justice to a thief, as is my duty. Lord Rall will not stand for this false imprisonment. I demand to see my brother. Oba glared at the two guards. Go get him. Both men blinked at what they saw in his eyes. Without further word, they left. Oba glanced back at the men locked in with him. As he met each man's eyes in turn, he gnawed a hind leg off the limp rat. They moved aside for him to pace as he chewed, little rat bones crunch, crunch, crunching. He looked out the opening again but saw no one else. Oba sighed. The palace was immense. It might be some time before the guards returned to let him out. The men in the room with him silently backed out of the way as Oba went back to his spot against the wall opposite the door and sat down. They stood watching him. 
Oba watched back as he tore another chunk off the rat with the teeth at the side of his mouth. They were all fascinated by him, he knew. He was almost royalty. Maybe he was royalty. He was a Rall. They had probably never seen anyone as important as him before and were in awe. You said they don't feed us. He waved what was left of the limp rat at their silent stares. I'll not starve. He pulled off the tail and discarded it. Animals ate rat tails. He was hardly an animal. You're not just an oaf, Crooked Teeth said in a quiet voice, filled with contempt. You're a crazy bastard. Oba exploded across the room and had the man by the throat before anyone could so much as gasp in surprise. Oba lifted the squealing, kicking, crooked-toothed criminal up to where he could glare eye to eye. Then with a mighty shove, Oba rammed him against the wall. The man went as limp as the rat. Oba looked back and saw that the others had backed against the far wall. He let the man slip to the floor, where he moaned as he comforted the back of his shaved head. Oba lost interest. He had more important things to think about than bashing this man's brains out, even if he was a criminal. He went back to his place and lay down on the cold stone. He had been ill and might not be fully recovered. He had to take care of himself. He needed his rest. Oba lifted his head. When they come for me, wake me up, he told the four men still silently watching him. It amused him to see how fascinated they were by having nobility in their midst. Still, they were common criminals. He would have them executed. There's five of us and only one of you, one of the men said. What makes you think you'll ever wake up again after you close your eyes? There was no mistaking the threat in his voice. Oba grinned up at him. The voice grinned with him. The man's eyes widened. He swallowed and backed away until his shoulders smacked the wall. Then he shuffled sideways. When he reached the far corner, he slid down and pulled his knees up close to himself. Whimpering, tears running down his cheeks, he turned his face away and hid his eyes behind a trembling shoulder. Oba laid his head down on his outstretched arm and went to sleep. Chapter 42 Faint footsteps coming from beyond the door woke Oba from his nap. He opened his eyes, but he didn't move or make a sound. The men were peeking out the opening in the door. When the distant footsteps sounded like they began coming closer, all but one man moved back. The single man remained at the door, standing watch. He stretched up on his toes, gripped the bars, and pressed his face close, trying to get a better look down the hall. Off in the distance, Oba could hear the metallic clangs and echoing squeals of doors being unlocked and pulled open. The man at the door remained motionless for a time as he watched. Then he suddenly stepped back. They turned this way. They're coming this way, he whispered to the others. All five of the men huddled closer on the far side of the room. Whispers passed among them. But what if a moored Sith comes in instead, one of the men whispered. Makes no difference to us, another man said. I know some about their kind... Their magic works to capture those with the gift. It makes them safe from magic, not muscle. But their weapon will still work on us, the first said. Not if we all overpower her and take it away from her, came the insistent whisper in answer. There are five of us. We're stronger, and we outnumber her. But what if... What do you think they're going to do with us? One of the others whispered in a heated voice. If we don't take this chance, we're as good as dead in here. I don't see what other chance we have. I say we do it and get away. There were nods in turn from each man. Satisfied, they straightened and moved off to different parts of the room, making it appear as if they wanted nothing to do with one another. Oba knew they were up to something. One man took a quick check out the opening again, then moved away from the door. One of the other men came closer and jostled Oba with the side of his foot. They're back. Wake up. You hear? Oba moaned, feigning sleep. The man nudged with his foot again. You wanted us to tell you when they came back. Wake up now. He stepped away when Oba stirred, yawning and stretching to pretend he was just then waking. The men, all except the one who had already seen more than he wanted to see in Oba's eyes, glanced his way before they settled on a spot to stand. While they waited, they struck slouching poses, trying hard to appear detached and disinterested. Down the passageway, two people spoke in words Oba couldn't quite make out, but he could hear their voices well enough to tell that their brief conversation was no more than businesslike. The footsteps finally stopped just outside the door. A key turned in the lock. The clang from the bolt as it snapped back echoed through the hall. The men cast quick glances to the door. Outside, a man grunted with the effort of a strong tug. The door grated as it yielded, admitting more light. 
Oba was astonished to see a woman silhouetted in the doorway. Outside in the hall, the big guard with her used the candle from a holder on the wall to light his lamp. While the woman stood just inside the door, casually appraising the men to each side, the guard brought the lamp into the room and hung it on the wall to the side. The lamp threw harsh light across the men's faces and revealed the grim, impenetrable reality of the confines of the rough-hewn stone room. Oba saw then, too, what a truly mean and nasty-looking lot the men were. With cunning animal eyes glinting out from the shadows, they all watched the woman. In the bleak lamplight, Oba saw that she was wearing the strangest outfit he had ever seen, skin-tight red leather. Tall and shapely, she wore her long, blonde hair in a single braid. Something dangled from a thin chain around her right wrist as her hand rested on her hip. Though she was not taller than the men, her commanding presence alone made her seem to tower like some austere fury come to judge the living in their last hours. Her scowl was as dark with displeasure as any Oba's mother had ever worn. But Oba was even more astonished to see her signal with a casual flip of her hand dismissing the guard who had unlocked the door. If it surprised Oba, it didn't faze the guard. After a last glance around at the men, he pulled the heavy door closed behind himself and locked it. Oba could hear the guard's boots against the stone floor as he departed back down the hall. The woman's cool scrutiny swept over the men around her, appraising each, dismissing each, until at last her glare descended on Oba. Her piercing stare carefully studied his face. Dear spirits, she whispered to herself at what she saw in his eyes. Eyes. Oba grinned. He knew she recognized that he was telling the truth about his paternity. She could see in his eyes that he was the son of Dark and Rawl. Eyes. Understanding suddenly clicked into place for him like a knife into its sheath. And then, bellowing like animals, the men all leaped toward her. Oba expected her to cry out in fright, or scream for help, or at least flinch. Instead, she stood her ground and casually met their attack. Oba saw some kind of red rod, the one he had seen before hanging near her hand, spin up into her fist. As the first man reached her, she rammed the rod against his chest, pushing him back with a twist of her wrist. He dropped like a hay bale out of the loft, thud onto the stone floor. Nearly at the same time, the others pounced from all directions in a flurry of flailing arms and fists. The woman sidestepped effortlessly, avoiding the trap of meaty arms as it snapped shut. As the men lurched around, hastily trying to renew their attack, she moved with cold grace, meeting each man swiftly and methodically and with staggering violence. Without turning, she drove her elbow back into the face of the closest man as he tried to seize her from behind. Oba heard bone crack as his head snapped back, throwing a long string of blood against the wall. The third man to the side was checked by her strange red rod against his neck. He crumpled, holding his throat, crying out in a choking, gurgling blubber. Blood frothed at his mouth as he twisted on the floor, reminding Oba of nothing so much as the way the snake in the swamp had wriggled in death. Eluding another lunge, the woman spun away, past and over the man on the floor. As she did so, she hammered the heel of her boot down, smashing his face to finish him. As she swung around, she delivered three rapid strikes to the neck of the fourth man. His eyes rolled back in his head before he slowly started corkscrewing down. Her legs swept his feet from under him, pitching him face forward. His forehead smacked the stone floor with a sickening crack. Her economy of motion, the easy flowing evasion, followed by a swift and brutal counterattack, was fascinating to watch. The last man flew at her with his full weight behind the lunge. She wheeled around, backhanding him across the face so hard that it spun him around like a top. She snatched him by the hair at the back of his head, jerked him from his feet, and with a thrust of that strange red rod into his back, drove him to his knees. It was crooked teeth. He shrieked louder than Oba had ever been able to get anyone to shriek. Oba was amazed by her ability to inflict pain. She held crooked teeth by the hair on his knees before her as he screamed in desperate agony, begging for release as he tried without effect to twist away from her. With a knee in his back, along with the red rod, she bent his head back to control him as easily as if he were a child. And then, as she looked up very deliberately into Oba's eyes, she pressed the red rod against the base of the man's skull. His arms thrashed out in a crazy fashion as his entire body convulsed as violently as if he'd been struck by lightning. He went limp, blood running from his ears. 
finished with him, the woman released her fist from his hair and let him pitch forward to the stone floor. It was clear to Oba by the boneless way he fell that he was already dead and didn't feel the heavy impact against the unyielding stone. It was all over in what seemed like no more than five heartbeats, one for each man killed. Blood everywhere glistened in the light from the lamp. All five men lay sprawled in awkward positions around the room. The woman in red leather wasn't even breathing hard. She stepped closer. Sorry to disappoint you, but you won't escape that easily. Oba grinned. She wanted him. He reached out and grabbed her left breast. With a grimace of rage, she lashed her strange red rod down on the top of his shoulder beside his neck. Oba reached out with his other hand and grabbed her other breast. He gave them both a firm squeeze as he grinned at her. How could you not? She fell silent as some profound inner understanding suddenly filled her expression. Oba liked her breasts. They were as nice as any he had ever held. Still, she was quite the unusual woman. He had a feeling that he would learn many new things with her. Her fist came out of nowhere with deadly speed. Oba caught it in the palm of his hand. He closed his fingers tight around her fist, squeezing as he twisted it back, turning her around so that her back was arched and her shoulders pressed against him. She rammed her free elbow toward his middle, but he was expecting it, and snatched her forearm, using the momentum to wrench it up behind her so he could gather it up with the fingers of his other hand already holding her other arm. That left him a hand to feel the delights of her feminine form. He slid his free hand around the front of her waist, in under the leather. She twisted with all her strength, trying to get free. She knew how to use leverage to try to wrench out of an opponent's grip, but her strength wasn't anywhere near up to the task. Oba slipped his hand down the front of her skin-tight leather pants, feeling her taut flesh. The vixen drove her heel into his shin. Oba recoiled, crying out, just managing to hold on to her. But then she spun around, ducked under his arms, and broke his grip. Quick as a blink, she was free. Rather than run, she used her momentum to strike at the side of his neck. Oba was able to partially deflect the blow at the last possible instant, but it still hurt. More than that, it angered him. He was tired of playing gentle games. He caught her arm, twisting it around until she cried out. He swept his leg around to knock her feet out from under her first, then threw his full weight into her. Oba roughly wrestled her around as they crashed to the floor, landing on top of her, driving the wind from her lungs. Before she could get a breath, he slammed a good punch into her middle. He could see in her eyes how much it hurt her. He was going to see much more in her eyes before he was done with her. As they struggled on the floor, Oba had the clear advantage and used it. He began tearing at her clothes. She had no intention of making it easy and fought with everything she had. Her fighting, though, was unexpected in Oba's experience. She didn't fight to get away, as other women did. She fought instead to hurt him. Oba knew then how desperately she wanted him. He intended to give her the satisfaction she craved, to give her what she had never been able to get from any man before. His powerful fingers pulled up on the top of her leather outfit, but it was cinched tight around her middle with a thick overbelt. The back of the outfit was crisscrossed with a web of tight straps and buckles. It was too strong to rip. Oba managed instead to strip it up past her ribs. The sight of her flesh ignited him. He fought her hands, her feet, even her head, as she tried to butt his face. Despite her best efforts, he managed to yank and tug the bottom of her tight outfit part way down over the curve of her hips. She struggled ever more violently, trying every move she could to hurt him. He could sense that she wanted him so badly she was hardly able to control herself. As he was devoting his attention to trying to get her bottom off, her teeth seized his other forearm. The shock of pain stiffened him. Instead of pulling back, he rammed the arm in her teeth at her, smacking the back of her head against the stone. The second whack against the stone floor took a lot of the fight out of her, and he was able to free his arm. Oba didn't want her unconscious. He wanted her awake. He watched her eyes as he rolled on top of her, forcing his knee between her thighs, and was pleased to see by the way she gritted her teeth, the way her eyes tracked his, that she was indeed aware of him. Cognition was integral to the experience. It was important that she be aware of what was happening to her, of the transformations that would take place in her living body, aware of death stalking near, waiting, watching. It was essential to Oba that he see all her primal emotions and sensations through her expressive eyes. 
He licked the side of her neck back behind her ear where the fine little hairs felt soft on his tongue. His teeth raked their way back down. Her neck tasted delightful. He knew she liked the feel of his lips and teeth on her, but she had to fight to keep up the pretense, lest he think her promiscuous. It was all part of her game. By the way she struggled, though, he knew how much she itched for him. As he nuzzled her neck, he worked with his other hand to unbuckle his trousers. You've always wanted it like this, he whispered hoarsely, nearly delirious with his lust for her. Yes, she answered breathlessly. Yes, you understand. This was new. He had never been with a woman before who was comfortable enough with her own needs to admit them aloud, except through the show of moans and cries. Oba realized that she must be frantic with desire to cast off pretense and confess her true feelings. It drove him crazy with hunger for her. Please, she panted against the shoulder he had pressed to her jaw, holding her head against the floor. Let me help you. This was definitely new. Help me. Yes, she confided urgently up toward his ear. Let me help you unfasten your trousers so that you'll be free to touch me where I need it most. Oba was eager to oblige her brazen desires. Leaving her to the treasured task of opening his trousers left him free to grope her. She was a delightful creature, a fitting mate to a man like him, a Rahl, almost a prince. He had never had such a wonderfully unexpected and intimate experience. Apparently, knowing that he was royalty drove women delirious with uncontrollable yearnings. Oba grinned at her shameless need while her covetous fingers fumbled at unbuttoning his trousers. He shifted his weight to give her a little room for her work as he leisurely explored her feminine secrets. Please, she breathed in his ear again as she finally got his trousers undone. Let me hold you down there, please. She was so hot for him that she had completely abandoned her dignity. He had to admit, though, that it didn't put him off. Biting her neck, he grunted his permission for her to go ahead. Oba lifted his hips so she could get at the objects of her lewd desire. He moaned with pleasure as she stretched her lithe body to reach down under him. He felt her long, cool fingers gathering up his most private parts into her lovely hand. Driven by his unrestrained passion for her, Oba bit into her sumptuous neck again. She moaned with the feel of his teeth as she urgently collected his sack together in her greedy hand. He would reward her with the slowest death he could give her. She suddenly wrenched her handful around with such abrupt violence that as Oba jerked up, he went blind with the shock. The lightning jolt of pain was so acute that he couldn't draw a breath. While he was momentarily immobilized by the trauma, she lunged lower and seized him in a more tenacious grip. Without pause, she mercilessly wrung him even more forcibly the second time. His eyes bulged as he convulsed but once, tenting over her, the spasm fixing his muscles into stiff, stark rigidity. His thinking scrambled. He couldn't hear, see, breathe, or even cry out. He was paralyzed, iron-bound in pure agony. Everything was one long, fiery, sharp, twisting pang. It went on without end. His mouth rounded, trying to scream, but no sound came out. It seemed forever before blurred vision started to return along with jumbled sounds that filled his ringing ears. The room suddenly spun wildly. Tumbling across the stone floor, Oba realized he had been kicked in his side hard enough to drive the remaining wind from him. It was a complete mystery to him. He slammed into the wall and flopped to a stop. He had to pull hard several times before he could draw a breath. The pain lancing his side felt like a cow had kicked him, but it was nothing compared to the searing inferno in his groin. Then Oba saw the guard. The man had come back. That was who had kicked him in the side. Him, not her. She was still sprawled on the floor, her lovely flesh exposed in a teasing manner. The guard had a sword to hand. He went to one knee near the woman, checking her with quick glances. Mistress Nida! Mistress Nida, are you all right? She groaned as she tottered haltingly to her hands and knees, while the man in a crouch, feet spread, watched Oba. He looked like he feared to help her, to even look at her, but he didn't look to fear Oba. Oba lay back against the wall, gathering his wits as he watched the two of them. She didn't try to cover her hips, her exposed breasts. Oba knew that she was still game for him, but with the guard there, she couldn't show her feelings. She must be insane with lust for him to have provoked him so by what she had done. Oba pushed himself up a bit, getting his wind back, as the feeling began returning to his tingling extremities. 
He watched the woman, Mistress Nida, the guard had called her, staggering to her feet. Oba lay still, listening to the voice whispering to him as he watched sweat run across her skin. She was divine. He still had much to learn from a woman like this. There were pleasures untold yet to come. Still recovering his strength, Oba rose up, leaning against the wall, watching as she provocatively used the back of one hand to wipe blood from her mouth. With her other hand, she tugged at her leather outfit, trying to cover herself. She was dazed, no doubt by her heady brush with lust, and was unable to get her trembling hands to work right. Having trouble balancing, she staggered sideways a couple of steps. It appeared as if it was all she could do to stand. Oba was surprised that her bones weren't broken considering their brief but vigorous love tussle. There would be time for that. Blood trickled from the love bites on her neck. He noticed that her blonde hair was matted with blood from when he had banged her head against the stone floor. Oba reminded himself to be mindful of his strength lest he end it prematurely. That had happened before. He had to be careful. Women were delicate. Oba, still panting to catch his breath, still hobbled by the throbbing ache between his legs, fixed his gaze on the guard. The man had remarkable control to stand there so confidently, considering that he was in the presence of a Rall. Their gazes met. The man took a step forward. The eyes of the voice opened to look at him, too. The man froze. Oba grinned. Mistress Nida, the guard whispered, his eyes staring fixed on Oba. I think you'd better get out of here. She frowned at him as she tried to pull her leather up over her shapely hips. She was still having trouble balancing, and trying to tug her outfit back into place wasn't helping. We don't want her to leave, Oba said. The guard's wide eyes stared. We don't want her to leave, Oba said again in unison with the voice. We can both enjoy her. We don't want her to leave, the guard repeated. Pausing in her attempt to cover herself, Mistress Nida looked from the guard to Oba. Bring her to me, Oba commanded, amazed at what the voice could think of and delighted by the very notion. Bring her over here and we will both have her. The woman, still unsteady, followed Oba's gaze to the guard. When she saw his face, she tried to snatch her dangling red rod. The guard seized her wrist, preventing her from getting at it. His other hand swept around her waist. She fought him, but he was a big man, and she was already woozy. Oba grinned as he watched the guard dragging the struggling Nida closer. The man's fingers roamed over her exposed flesh as Oba's had done. She feels delightful, don't you think? Oba asked. The guard smiled and nodded as he wrestled the woman toward the back of the prison cell where Oba and the voice waited. When they were close enough, Oba reached for her. It was time he finished what he had started. Finished it good. She seized the guard's clothes in her fists for support. With stunning speed, her whole body twisted in midair. From nowhere, for just an instant, Oba saw the bottom of the heel of her boot flying at his face like a bolt of lightning. Before he could react, the world went black amid a stunning crash of pain. Chapter 43 Oba opened his eyes to darkness. He was lying on his back on a stone floor. His face throbbed in pain. He drew his knees up and comforted his aching groin. That vixen, Nida, had proven as troublesome as any woman he had ever known. It seemed like he was always being tormented by troublesome women. They were all jealous of him, of his importance. They were all trying to keep him down. Oba was getting weary of waking up in cold, dark places, too. He had hated the way throughout his life he was always waking up in some confined place. They were always hot or cold. No place he had ever been locked in was ever comfortable. He wondered if his lunatic mother, or the troublesome sorceress Lethea, or her swamp witch sister had something to do with this. They were selfish and certain to be bent on revenge. This had all the markings of a vindictive act by that pompous trio. But they were dead. Oba wasn't entirely certain that death protected him from those three harpies. They were devious in life. Death wasn't likely to have reformed them. The more he thought about it, though, he had to admit that this was most likely entirely the doing of that vixen in red leather, Nida. She had cleverly pretended to be dizzy and disoriented until the guard had brought her close enough to strike, and then she had kicked him. She was something. It was hard to hold a grudge against a woman who wanted him so badly. 
The thought of not having Oba exclusively probably drove her to it. She wanted to be alone with him. He supposed he couldn't blame her. Now that he had publicly acknowledged his royal standing, Oba had to recognize that there would be women of such intense passions who would want what he had to offer. He had to be prepared to live up to the demands of being a true Rahl. Groaning in pain, Oba rolled over. With the aid of his hands, pushing first against the floor and then a wall, he was finally able to lever himself upright. His own discomfort would only heighten the pleasures of the eventual conquest of his concubine. He had learned that somewhere. Maybe the voice had told him. He saw a small slit of light, much smaller than the opening in the door in the last place, but it at least helped him get his bearings. Feeling along the cold stone walls, he began to take stock of the room. Almost immediately, he came to a corner. He moved his hand sideways from the corner along the rough stone of the wall and was alarmed when he shortly came to another corner. With increasing urgency, he traced the walls and was horrified to discover how tiny the room was. He must have been lying corner to corner, for it wasn't large enough for him to lie down any other way. The suffocating terror of such a small place welled up, threatening to smother him. He couldn't get his breath. He pressed a hand to his throat, trying mightily to pull a breath. He was certain he would go mad being confined in such a small pen. Maybe it wasn't Nida after all. This did have all the marks of his insidious mother's doing. Perhaps she had been watching from the world of the dead, gleefully conniving, plotting how she could harass him. The troublesome sorceress had probably helped her. The swamp witch had no doubt butted in to offer her assistance. Together, the three women had managed to reach out from the world of the dead and help the vixen Nida lock him back in a tiny place. He raced around the cramped little room, feeling the walls, terrified that they were shrinking in toward him. He was too big to be in such a small room where he couldn't even breathe. Fearing he might use up all the air in the room and then slowly suffocate, Oba threw himself against the door and pressed his face up against the opening, trying to suck in the outside air. Weeping with self-pity, Oba wanted nothing so much at that moment as to bash his lunatic mother's head in all over again. After a time, he listened to the voice counseling him, reassuring him, calming him, and began gathering his wits. He was smart. He had triumphed over all those who had conspired against him, despite how evil they were. He would get out. He would. He had to pull himself together and act up to his station in life. He was overall. He was invincible. Oba put his eyes up to the slit to peer out, but he could see little more than another dim space beyond. He wondered if maybe he was in a box inside a box, and for a time he pounded at the door, screaming and crying at the terror of such a sinister torture. How could they be so cruel? He was a Rahl. How could they do this to an important person? Why would they treat him this way? First, they locked him up as a common criminal, in with the scum of humanity for doing the right thing and dispensing justice to rid the land of a lawless thief, and now this wicked persecution. Oba concentrated, putting his mind to something else. He remembered then the look on Nida's face when she had first gazed into his eyes. She had recognized him for who he was. Nida had known the truth, that he was the son of Dark and Rawl just by looking into his eyes. Small wonder she had wanted him so badly. He was important. Selfish people were like that. They wanted to be near those who were great, and then they wanted to keep them down. She was jealous. That was why he was locked up. Petty jealousy. It was as simple as that. Oba pondered that look in Nida's eyes when she had first seen him. The look of recognition on her face had sparked memories that enabled him to put odd bits together. He mulled over the new thing he had learned. Jensen was his sister. They were both holes in the world. It was too bad she was kin. She was seductively beautiful. He thought her ringlets of red hair were quite bewitching, even if he worried that they might signify some magical ability. Oba sighed as he pictured her in his mind. He was too principled to consider her as a lover. They shared the same father, after all. Despite her ravishing looks and the way thinking of her made his groin wake, if painfully, his integrity wouldn't allow such a breach of decency. He was Oberal, not some rutting animal. Darkenral had fathered her, too. That was a wonder. Oba wasn't sure what he thought about that. They shared a bond. The two of them stood against a world of jealous people who wanted to keep them from greatness. 
Lord Rahl sent quads to hunt her, so she would have no loyalty there. Oba wondered if it could be that she might be a valuable ally. On the other hand, he recalled the anxiety in her eyes when she looked at him. Maybe she recognized in his eyes who he was, that he too was the son of Dark and Rahl, like she was. Maybe she already had plans of her own that didn't include him. Maybe she was upset that he existed. Maybe she too would be an adversary, intent on having it all for herself. Lord Rahl, their own brother, wanted to keep them down because they were both important. That much seemed likely. Lord Rahl didn't want to share all the riches that rightfully belonged to Jensen and Oba. Oba wondered if Jensen would be as selfish. After all, such selfish tendencies seemed to run in the family. How Oba had avoided that wicked aspect of heritage was a wonder. Oba felt his pockets, recalling as he did so that he had done the same thing when he had been in the other room with the criminals, but his pockets were empty. Lord Rahl's people had stripped him of his wealth before locking him away. They had probably taken it for themselves. The world was full of thieves, all after Oba's hard-earned wealth. Oba paced, as best he could in such a confined place, trying not to think of how small it was. All the while he listened to the voice advising him. The more he listened, the more things made sense to him. More and more items on the mental lists he kept began falling into place. The grand tapestry of lies and deception that had so afflicted him knitted itself together into a broader picture, and solutions began to solidify. His mother had known all along, of course, how important Oba really was. She had wanted to keep him down from the first. She had locked him in his pen because she was jealous of him. She was jealous of her own little boy. She was a sick woman. Lethea had known, too, and had conspired with his mother to poison him. Neither had the bold nerve to simply do away with him. They weren't that kind. They both hated him for his greatness and enjoyed making him suffer. So their plan from the first appeared to have been to poison him slowly. They called it a cure so as to soothe their guilty consciences. All along his mother wore him down with menial chores, treated him with contempt, heaped endless scorn on him, and then sent him to Lethea to retrieve his own poison. Loving son that he was, he had gone along with their devious plans, trusting in their words, their instructions, never suspecting that his mother's love was a cruel lie or that they might have a secret plan. The bitches, the conniving bitches. They had both gotten what they deserved. And now Lord Rahl was trying to hide him, to deny to the world that he existed. Oba paced, thinking it through. There was too much he still didn't know. After a time he calmed and did as the voice told him. He went to the door and put his mouth near the opening. He was, after all, invincible. I need you, he spoke into the darkness beyond. He didn't shout the words, he didn't have to, because the voice inside added to his own would make it carry. Come to me, he said into the quiet emptiness outside the door. Oba was surprised by the calm confidence, the authority in his own voice. His endless talents amazed him. It was only to be expected that those less endowed would resent him. Come to me, he and the voice spoke into the empty darkness beyond. They had no need to yell. The darkness effortlessly bore their voices like shadows traveling on wings of gloom. Come to me, he said, bending unsuspecting inferior minds to his will. He was Oba Rahl. He was important. He had important things to do. He couldn't stay in this place and play their petty games. He had had enough of this nonsense. It was time to assume the mantle of not just his birthright, but his special nature. Come to me, he said, their voices oozing through the dark cracks of the deep dungeon. He kept calling, not loudly, for he knew they could hear him, not urgently, for he knew they would come, not desperately, for he knew they would obey. Time passed, but did not matter, for he knew they were on their way. Come to me, he murmured into the still darkness, for he knew that a softer voice yet would draw them in. Off in the distance, he heard the faint answer of footsteps. Come to me, he whispered, enthralling those beyond to listen. He heard a door in the distance grate open. The footsteps grew louder, closer. Come to me, he and the voice cooed. 
Closer still, he heard men shuffling along a stone floor. A shadow in the dim light fell across the small opening in the door beyond. What is it? a man asked, his echoing voice tentative. You must come to me, Oba told him. The man hesitated at so pure and innocent a declaration. Come to me now, Oba and the voice commanded with deadly authority. As Oba listened, the key in the far lock turned. The heavy door rasped open. A guard stepped into the space between the doors. The shadow of the other guard filled the outer doorway. The guard edged closer to the small slit where Oba waited on the other side. Wide eyes peered in. What do you want? the man asked in a hesitant voice. We wish to leave now, Oba and the voice said. Open the door. It is time for us to go from here. The man bent forward and worked at the lock until the bolt snapped back with a metallic clang that echoed in the darkness. The door pulled back, squeaking on rusty hinges. The other man stepped up behind him, looking in with the same lifeless expression. What would you like us to do? the guard asked, his eyes unblinking as he stared into Oba's eyes. We must leave, Oba and the voice said. You two will guide us out of here. Both guards nodded and turned to lead Oba away from the dark pen. He would never again be locked in confining little places. He had the voice to help him. He was invincible. He was glad that he had remembered that. Althea had been wrong about the voice. She was just jealous, like all the others. He was alive and the voice had helped him. She was just dead. He wondered how she liked that. Oba told the two guards to lock the doors of his empty cell. That would make it more likely that it would be a while before he was discovered missing. He would have a small head start to escape Lord Rahl's greedy grasp. The guards led Oba through a labyrinth of narrow, dark passageways. The men moved with unerring steps, avoiding those halls where Oba could hear men talking in the distance. He didn't want them to know he was leaving. Better if he simply slipped away without a confrontation. I need my money back, Oba said. Do you know where it is? Yes, one of the guards said in a dead voice. They went through iron doors and onward through passageways lined with coarse stone blocks. They turned down a passageway where there were men in cells to each side, coughing, snickering, cursing through the openings in the doors. When they approached the row of doors, filthy arms reached out, clawing the air. As the somber guards, carrying lamps, led the way down the center of the wide hall, men grabbed for them, or spat at them, or cursed them. As Oba passed, the men all fell silent. The arms drew back in through the openings. Shadows trailed behind Oba like a dark cape. The three of them, Oba and his escort of two guards, reached a small room at the bottom of narrow twisting stairs. One guard led Oba up the stairs while the other followed. At the top, they took him into a locked room and then through another locked door. The lamps the guards carried in cast angular shadows through the rows of shelves heaped with things, clothing, weapons, and various personal possessions, everything from canes to flutes to puppets. Oba scanned the shelves, crammed with odd things, stooping to look low, stretching up on his tiptoes to check the upper shelves. He guessed that all these things were taken from prisoners before they were locked away. Near the end of one row, he spotted the handle of his knife. Behind the knife was a mound of the tattered clothes that he had taken from Althea's house so that he could make it across the Azrith plains. His boot knife was there, too. Piled in front were the cloth and leather pouches containing his considerable fortune. He was relieved to have his money back. He was even more relieved to once again curl his fingers around the smooth wooden handle of his knife. You two will be my escorts, Oba informed the guards. Where shall we escort you, one asked. Oba mulled over the question. This is my first visit. I wish to see some of the palace. He restrained himself from calling it his palace. That would come in time. For now there were other matters that must come first. He followed them up stone stairwells, through corridors and past intersections, and myriad flights of stairs. Patrolling soldiers off in the distance saw his guards and paid little attention to the man between them. When they came to an iron door, one of his guards unlocked it, and they stepped through into a corridor beyond with a polished marble floor. Oba was taken by the splendor of the hall, the fluted columns to the sides, and the arched ceiling. The three of them marched onward around several corners lit by dramatic silver lamps hung in the center of marble panels. 
The hall turned again to open into a grand courtyard of such staggering beauty that it cast the hall they had been in, that had been the finest place Oba had ever seen, as little more than a pigsty by contrast. He stood motionless, his mouth hanging, as he stared out at a pool of water open to the sky with trees, trees growing on the other side as if it were a woodland pond, except that this was indoors, and the pond was surrounded by a low, bench-like enclosure of polished, rust-colored marble, and the pond was lined with blue glazed tiles. There were orange fish gliding through the pond, real fish, real orange fish, indoors. In his whole life, Oba had never been so struck dumb by the grandeur, the beauty, the sheer majesty of a place. This is the palace, he asked his escorts. Only a tiny part of it, one answered. Only a tiny part, Oba repeated in astonishment. Is the rest as nice as this? No, most places are much more grand, with soaring ceilings, arches, and massive columns between balconies. Balconies? Inside? Yes, People on different levels can look down on lower levels, down on grand courtyards and quadrangles. On some levels, vendors sell their wares, the other man said. Some areas are public areas. Some places are quarters for soldiers or staff. There are some places where visitors may rent rooms. Oba took this all in as he stared at the well-dressed people moving through the place, at the glass, marble, and polished wood. After I've seen some more of the palace, he announced to his two big uniformed Daharan escorts, I will want a quiet and very private room, luxurious, mind you, but someplace out of the way where I won't be noticed. I will first want to purchase some decent clothes and some supplies. You two will stand watch and make sure that no one knows I'm here while I have a bath and get a good night's rest. How long will we be watching you, the other man asked. We will be missed if we're away for too long. If we're gone even longer, they will search for us and find your cell empty. Then they will come looking for you. They will soon know you are here. Oba considered. Hopefully I can leave tomorrow. Will you be missed by then? No, one of the two said, his eyes empty of everything but the desire to do Oba's bidding. We were just leaving at the end of our guard watch. We shouldn't be missed before tomorrow. Oba smiled. The voice had chosen the right men. By then I'll be on my way. But until then I should enjoy my visit and see some of the palace. Oba's fingers glided over the handle of his knife. Maybe tonight I might even like the company of a woman at dinner, a discreet woman. Both men bowed. Before he left, Oba would leave the two as nothing more than a stain of ashes on the floor of a lonely passageway. They would never tell anyone why his cell was empty. And then, well, it was nearly spring, and in spring who could tell where his fancy might turn? One thing for sure, he was going to have to find Jensen. Chapter 44 Jensen's astonishment was wearing off. She was becoming numb to the sight of the endless expanse of men, like some dark flood of humanity across the bottom land. The vast army had churned the broad plain between the rolling hills to a drab brown. Inestimable numbers of tents, wagons, and horses were crowded in among the soldiers. The drone of the horde cut through with yelling, hoots, calls, whistles, the rattle of gear, the clatter of hooves, the rumble of wagons, the singing rhythm of hammers on steel, the squeals of horses, and even occasional odd cries and screams of what almost sounded to Jensen like women could be heard for miles. It was like gazing down on some impossibly huge city, but without buildings or pattern, as if all of man's ingenuity, order, and works had magically vanished with the people left behind reduced to near savages under the gathering dark clouds, trying to make do against the forces of nature and having a grim time of it. Nor was this the worst of the conditions Jensen had seen. Several weeks before, and farther to the south, she and Sebastian had passed through the very place where the army of the Imperial Order had wintered. An army of this size wore heavily on the land, but she had been shocked at how much worse it was when they stopped for any length of time. It would be years before that vast, festering wound in the landscape healed. Worse still, throughout the long, harsh winter, men by the thousands had fallen ill. That dismal place would be forever haunted by an endless expanse of haphazardly placed graves marking those left behind when the living had marched on. It was horrifying to see such a staggering loss of life to sickness. Jensen feared to imagine the far worse carnage to come in the battle for freedom. 
With the frost finally out of the ground, the muddy soil had dried and firmed enough that the army had at last been able to strike out from those befouled winter quarters to start their drive toward Aidendril, the seat of power in the Midlands. Sebastian had told her that the force they brought up from the old world was so huge that while the leading edge was stopping here to set up camp, it would be hours before those at the tail end caught up and halted for the night. In the morning, the head of the great army would have to start off, stretching itself out long before the end could have room to begin to move. While their spring march north was not yet swift, their advance was inexorable. Sebastian said that once the men smelled their prey, their pulse and their pace would quicken. It was a terrible shame that Lord Rawls' greed for conquest and rule made this all necessary, that such a peaceful valley should be given over to men at war. With spring, the grasses were at last coming back to life, so that the hills rising up to each side of the valley looked as if they were covered in living green velvet. Forests took over on the steeper slopes beyond the hills. In the distance, off to the west and north, stone peaks still wore heavy mantles of snow. Headwaters, swollen with the snow melt, roared down the rocky slopes, and farther to the east, emptied into a mighty river that meandered out into a great lush plain. The dirt there was so black, so fertile, that Jensen imagined even rocks planted there might sprout roots and grow. Before she and Sebastian had come upon the vast stain of the army, the land had been as beautiful as any Jensen had seen in all her life. She longed to explore those enchanting forests, and fancied she could contentedly spend the rest of her life among such timber. It was hard for her to cast the Midlands as a place of evil magic. Sebastian had told her that those woods were dangerous places where beasts roamed, and where those who wielded magic lurked. With the things she was learning, she was almost tempted to risk it. She knew, though, that even in those trackless and seemingly endless forests, Lord Rawl would still find her. His men had already demonstrated their ability to locate her in even the most remote areas. Her mother's murder was only the first proof of that. Ever since that terrible day, his merciless assassins had somehow been able to hound her up through Dahara and halfway across the Midlands. If Lord Rawl's men caught her, they would take her back to the dungeons where Sebastian had been held, and then Lord Rawl would have her tortured endlessly before he granted her a slow, agonizing death. Jensen could have no safety, no peace, as long as Lord Rawl pursued her. She intended to catch him instead, and seize a life for herself. Another clot of sentries spotted her and Sebastian riding over the open ground, and moved down the slope from their observation post at the top of a hill to intercept them. When she and Sebastian were closer, and the men saw his spikes of white hair and the casual salute he gave them, they turned and swarmed back up the hill to their campfire and cooking their dinner. Like the rest of the Imperial Order army she had seen, the men were a rough-looking lot, in tattered clothes, furs, and hides. Down in the broad valley, many sat around small campfires outside little tents made of hides or oiled canvas. Most looked to have been set up wherever their owners had found enough space, rather than to any order. Randomly set among the tents were local command centers, mess tables, arms stockpiles, supply wagons, paddocks packed with livestock or horses, tradespeople laboring, and even blacksmiths working at transportable forges. Scattered here and there were small trading markets, where men gathered to barter or buy small goods. There were even agitated, angry, raw-boned men standing among the throngs, preaching to smatterings of vacant onlookers. What exactly the men were preaching, Jensen couldn't hear, but she had seen men preach before. According to her mother, the tempestuous body language prophesying doom and proselytizing salvation was as unmistakable as it was unchanging. As they rode closer into the immense encampment, she saw men at their tents occupied with everything from laughing and drinking to working at cleaning weapons and gear. Some men stood in crooked lines, arms thrown over the next fellow's shoulders, singing songs together. Others cooked by themselves, while still others crowded around mess areas waiting to be fed. Some men were occupied with chores and tending animals. She saw some men gambling and arguing. The entire place was dirty, smelly, noisy, and frighteningly confusing. As uncomfortable as she had always felt around crowds, this looked more terrifying even than a fevered nightmare. Descending toward the churning mass of humanity, she wanted to run in the opposite direction. Only her single burning reason for being there, and nothing else, kept her from doing so. She had reached the brink within and crossed over. 
she had embraced the need to kill and resolved with cold, deliberate calculation to do it. There could be no turning back. The uniforms the soldiers wore were not that. Uniform but seemed to be a mismatched collection of leather set with spikes, fur, chain mail, wool cloaks, hides, and filthy tunics. Almost all the burly men she saw were unshaven, grimy, grim. It was readily apparent why Sebastian was so easily recognized, and why no one ever challenged him. Yet she remained awed at how, without fail, every man who laid eyes on him gave him a salute. Sebastian stood out like a swan among maggots. Sebastian had explained how difficult it was to amass a huge army to defend their homeland, and what an arduous undertaking it was to send them on such a long journey. He said that they were men far from home with a grisly job to do. They couldn't be expected to look presentable for women folk, or pause in their life and death battles to be mannerly and make tidy camps. These were fighting men. So were Daharan soldiers. These men certainly didn't look anything like Daharan soldiers looked, nor were they as disciplined, but she didn't say so. Jensen could understand, though. As hard as she and Sebastian had been traveling, all the while taking precautions to evade Lord Rawls' men by riding until they nearly dropped with exhaustion, often backtracking and working hard at making false trails, she had little time to worry about looking her best. Added to that, it had been a long and difficult journey across mountains in winter. It often rankled her that Sebastian should see her with her hair all tangled when she was as filthy and sweaty as her horse and smelling no better. Still, he never seemed fazed by her all-too-often unkempt appearance. Rather, he usually seemed ignited by the mere sight of her, and often wanted nothing so much as to do whatever he could to please her. The previous day, they had taken a shorter route across hill country in order to make their way toward the head of the army, and had come across an abandoned farmhouse. Sebastian had indulged her wish to stay there for the night, even though it was early to make camp. After bathing and washing her long hair in the old tub in the tiny washroom, she put the water to use to wash out her clothes. Sitting before the warm fire Sebastian had built in the hearth, Jensen brushed her hair as it dried. She was nervous about meeting the emperor and wanted to look presentable. Sebastian, leaning back on an elbow, watched her before the flickering glow of flames, had smiled that wonderful smile of his, and said that even if she went unwashed and with tangled hair, she would be the most beautiful woman Emperor Jagang had ever seen. Now, as they rode along the fringes of the Imperial Order encampment, her stomach was in knots, even if her hair was not. From the looks of the turbulent clouds, moving in past the mountains to the west, a spring storm would be on them before long. Off above distant valleys, lightning flickered through the dark clouds. She hoped the rain didn't arrive to drench her hair and dress right before meeting the Emperor. There, Sebastian said, leaning forward in his saddle to point. Those are the Emperor's tents, and those of his important advisors and officers. Not far beyond, up the valley, will be Aiden Drill itself. He looked over with a grin. Emperor Jagang hasn't moved to take the city yet. We've made it in time. The huge tents were an imposing sight. The largest was oval, its tri-peaked roof pierced by three lofty center poles. The tent sides bore brightly colored panels. Standards and tassels hung from the eaves. High atop the three poles, colorful yellow and red banners flapped in the gusty wind, while long pennants streamed out, undulating like airborne serpents. The emperor's congregation of tents stood out among the drab little quarters of the regular soldiers, the way a king's palace towered over surrounding huts. Jensen's heart raced as they urged their horses down into the thick of the encampment. Both Rusty and Pete, their ears alert, snorted their misgivings about entering such a noisy and busy place. She urged Rusty ahead in order to take Sebastian's hand when offered it. Your hand is all sweaty, he said, smiling. You aren't nervous, are you? She was water at a boil, a horse at a gallop. Maybe a little, she said. But her purpose stiffened her will. Well, don't be. Emperor Jagang will be the one to be nervous meeting such a beautiful woman. Jensen could feel her face heat. She was about to meet an emperor. What would her mother think of such a thing? As she rode, she considered how her mother, as a young servant girl on the palace staff, a nobody, must have felt when she met Darkin Rall himself. Jensen could, for the first time, truly begin to empathize with the enormity of such an event in her mother's life. As she and Sebastian trotted their horses into camp, men everywhere peered Jensen's way. Mobs of men crowded closer to see the woman riding in. She saw that there were a number of soldiers with pikes forming a rough line along their route, holding back the press of men. 
She realized that the guards were clearing the way and preventing any of the more celebratory men from getting too close. Page 409. Sebastian watched her as she took note of the way the soldiers opened a clear path for them. The Emperor knows we're coming, he told her. But how? When we encountered scouts a few days ago and then sentries this morning as we got closer, they would have sent runners on ahead to inform Emperor Jagang that I've returned and that I'm not alone. Emperor Jagang would want to ensure the safety of any guest I would bring. It appeared to Jensen that the guards were meant to keep the great mass of regular soldiers away from the two of them. She thought it an odd thing to do, but by the drunken nature of some of the soldiers and the rough looks and leering grins of others, she couldn't say that she was sorry about it. The soldiers look so, I don't know, brutish, I guess. And as you are about to plunge your knife into Richard Rawls' heart, Sebastian said without pause, do you intend to curtsy and say please and thank you so that he will see how well-mannered you are? Of course not, but he turned his halting blue eyes on her. When those brutes came into your house and butchered your mother, what sort of men would you have wished were there to protect her? Jensen was taken aback. Sebastian, I don't know what that has to do... Would you trust dressy soldiers with polished leather and polite manners, like some pompous king would have at a fancy dinner party, to be the ones to make a desperate last stand protecting your beloved mother against the onslaught of vicious killers? Or would you want men even more brutish to be the ones to stand before your mother protecting her life? Wouldn't you want men steeped in the most brutal traditions of combat to be the ones standing between her and those savage men intent on killing her? I guess I see what you mean, Jensen admitted. These men are serving in that role for all their loved ones back in the old world. The unexpected encounter with that terrible memory was so chilling, so painful, that she had to work at putting it out of her mind. She felt humbled, too, by Sebastian's heated words. She was here for a reason. That reason was all that mattered. If the men arrayed against Lord Rawls' forces were tough and mean, so much the better. It wasn't until they reached the heavily defended compound around the Emperor's tents that Jensen saw other women. They were an odd mix, from young-looking to some who were stooped with age. Most peered curiously, some frowned, and a few even appeared alarmed, but all watched as Jensen rode closer. Why do the women all have rings through their lower lip, she whispered to Sebastian. His gaze swept the women near the tents, as a sign of loyalty to the imperial order, to Emperor Jagang. Jensen thought it not just a strange way to show loyalty, but disquieting. Most of the women wore drab dresses, most had unkempt hair. Some were dressed a little better, but only a little. Soldiers took the horses when they dismounted. Jensen stroked Rusty's ear and whispered reassuringly to the nervous animal that it was all right to go with the stranger. Once Rusty was calmed, Pete contentedly followed her toward the stable area. Parting from her constant companion of so long unexpectedly reminded Jensen of how she missed Betty. The women moved farther into the background as they watched, as if fearing to get too close. Jensen was used to such behavior. People feared her red hair. It was a rare, warm spring day and it had intoxicated Jensen with the promise of more such days. She had forgotten to put her hood up as they came close to the encampment. She started then to put it up, but Sebastian's hand stayed her arm. It's not necessary. With a tilt of his head, he indicated the women. Many of them are sisters of the light. They don't fear magic, only strangers entering the Emperor's compound. Jensen realized then the reason for the strange looks from a number of the women. They were gifted and saw her as a hole in the world, their eyes were seeing her, but their gift was not. Sebastian wouldn't be aware of that. She had never told him exactly what Althea had explained about the gifted and the offspring of a Lord Rall. Sebastian had, on more than one occasion, shown a condescending disgust in the details of magic. Jensen had never felt entirely comfortable talking to him about the specifics of what she had learned from the sorceress and the even more important things she had figured out on her own. It was all difficult enough for her to reconcile in her own mind and seemed too personal to reveal to him unless the time and circumstances were right. They never seemed to be. Jensen forced a smile at the women watching from the shadows of the tent. They stared back. Why is the emperor insulated from his men and guarded, she asked Sebastian. With this many men, you can never be absolutely certain that one isn't an infiltrator or even a deranged madman who might try to make a name for himself by harming Emperor Jagang. Such a foolish act would deprive us all of our great leader. With so much at risk, 
we have to take precautions. Jensen supposed she could understand. After all, Sebastian himself had been an infiltrator in the People's Palace. Had he come across an important man there, he could have done harm. The Daharans were troubled by such a threat. They had even arrested the right man. Fortunately, Jensen had been able to get him out. How she had been able to accomplish such a thing was part of what she had finally come to terms with, but could never find the right time to share with Sebastian. She didn't think he would understand anyway. He probably wouldn't even believe such a far-fetched notion. Sebastian's arm circled her waist and drew her onward toward two huge silent men standing guard outside the emperor's tent. Stepping between the two after they bowed their heads to him, Sebastian lifted aside a heavy doorway curtain covered with gold and silver medallions. Jensen had never even imagined, much less seen, such a lavish tent. But what she saw as she stepped inside was far more opulent than even the outside suggested. The ground was entirely covered with a variety of rich carpets laid every which way. An assortment of woven hangings, decorated with exotic scenes and elaborate designs, defined the space. Delicate glass bowls, fine pottery, and tall painted vases sat on the polished tables and chests around the room. To the side, there was even a tall glass-fronted bureau filled with painted plates displayed on stands. Colorful pillows in a variety of sizes rimmed the floor. Overhead, openings covered with sheer silk let in muted light. Scented candles shimmered everywhere, while all the carpets and hangings imposed a quiet hush to the air. The place felt sacred. There were women inside, each wearing the ring through her lower lip, busily going about duties. While most appeared absorbed in their work, one of the women, polishing a collection of tall, delicate vases in a measured, methodical manner, coolly watched Jensen out of the corner of her eye. She was middle-aged, broad-shouldered, and wore a simple floor-length dark gray dress buttoned to her neck. Her gray and black hair was loosely tied back. For the most part, she appeared unremarkable, except for the knowing, self-satisfied smirk that seemed enduringly etched in her face. That look gave Jensen pause. As their eyes met, the voice stirred, calling Jensen's name in that haunting dead whisper, calling for her to surrender. For some reason, Jensen was momentarily suffused with the icy sense that the woman knew that the voice had spoken. Jensen dismissed the odd notion, deciding that it was merely due to the woman's expression, which exuded a demeanor of stark superiority. Another woman busied herself brushing at the carpets with a small hand broom. Yet another was replacing candles that had guttered. Other women, some sure to be sisters of the light, hurried in and out of rooms beyond tending to the collection of pillows, lamps, and even flowers in vases. One thin young man wearing only baggy cotton trousers worked with a comb ordering the fringe of the carpet set before openings into back rooms. Except for the brown-eyed woman polishing the tall vases, they were focused on their work and none paid any particular notice that visitors had entered the emperor's tent. Sebastian's arm held her securely as he guided her deeper into the dimly lit room. The walls and ceiling moved and billowed slightly in the wind. Jensen's heart could have pounded no harder were she being led to her own execution. When she realized that her fingers were tightening around the hilt of her knife to check if it was clear in its scabbard, she forced herself to let her hand drop away from it. Near the back of the room sat an ornately carved and gilded chair draped with streamers of red silks. Jensen swallowed when she finally made herself look at the man sitting there, his elbow on the arm of the chair, his chin held by his thumb, his forefinger resting along the side of his face. He was a thick-necked bull of a man. Flickering candlelight reflecting off his shaved head lent the illusion that he wore a crown of tiny flames. Two long, thin braids of mustache grew down from the corners of his mouth, and another braid grew from the center of his chin. A fine gold chain connected the gold rings through his left nostril and ear, while a collection of much heavier jeweled chains rested in the cleft of muscles on his powerful chest. Each meaty finger was studded with a large ring. The lamb's wool vest he wore had no sleeves, revealing his hefty shoulders and brawny arms. While he didn't appear tall, his muscled mass was nonetheless imposing. But it was his eyes that, despite Sebastian's cautionary description, had her holding her breath. No words could have prepared her for being in the presence of the real thing. His inky eyes had no whites, no irises, no pupils, leaving only glistening dark voids. 
yet somber shapes shifted across those dark voids like thunder clouds at midnight. Despite his having no irises or pupils, she was certain beyond any doubt that he was looking directly and intently at her. Jensen thought her knees might buckle. When he smiled at her, she was sure of it. Sebastian's arm tightened, helping hold her up. He bowed slightly from the waist. Emperor, I am thankful that the Creator has watched over you and kept you safe. The smile widened. And you, Sebastian. Jagang's voice matched the look of him, husky, powerful, menacing. He sounded as if he were a man who brooked no weakness or excuses. It has been a long time, far too long. I'm glad to have you back with me. Sebastian bowed his head toward Jensen. Excellency, I have brought an important guest. This is Jensen. Despite Sebastian's arm around her waist holding her, she slipped free and went to her knees of her own accord, and before trepidation imposed it, she used the occasion to bow forward until her head nearly touched the floor. Sebastian hadn't told her that she was supposed to do so, but she felt an overwhelming fear that it was what she must do. If nothing else, it momentarily relieved her of the obligation of looking into those nightmare eyes. She supposed that a man like this a warrior who hoped to prevail against the invading force from Dahara had to be a man of brute strength, iron command, and grim tenacity. Being the emperor of a people hoping to be saved from the threatening shadow of enslavement was a job for a man no less than the one she knelt before. Your Excellency, she said in a trembling voice toward the floor, I am at your service. She heard a booming laugh. Come now, Jensen, no need for that. Jensen felt her face going scarlet as she rose with Sebastian's jovial insistence and help. Neither the Emperor nor Sebastian took note of her embarrassment. Sebastian, where did you ever find such a lovely young woman? Sebastian's blue eyes beheld her with pride. It's a long story for another time, Excellency. For now you must know that Jensen has come to an important determination, one that will bear on us all. Jagang's inky gaze returned to Jensen in a way that made her heart seem to rise up into her throat. He wore the slightest smile, the smirk of an emperor looking down indulgently on a nobody. And what would that determination be, young lady? Jensen. An image of her mother lying on the floor of their house, bleeding, dying, flashed into Jensen's mind. She would never forget her mother's last precious moments of life. The agonizing grief of having to flee without even being able to care for and bury her mother's body still burned unabated in her soul. Jensen! Rage flooded in to overwhelm any nervousness at answering an emperor's question. I intend to kill Lord Rahl, Jensen said. I have come to ask for your help. In the dead silence, any trace of mirth evaporated from the Emperor Jagang's face. He watched her with cold, dark, merciless eyes, his brow set in warning. This was clearly a subject that tolerated no humor. Lord Rahl had invaded this man's homeland, killed untold thousands of his people, and set the whole world to war and suffering. Emperor Jagang the Just, the muscles in his jaw flexing, waited, clearly expecting her to explain herself. I am Jensen Rahl, she said in answer to his dark glare. She drew her knife, gripped the blade in her rock-steady fist, and thrust the handle up before him on his throne, showing him the ornate letter R, the symbol of the House of Rahl. I am Jensen Rahl, she repeated, Richard Rahl's sister. I intend to kill him. Sebastian told me that you may be able to provide me some help to that end. If you can, I would be eternally in your debt. If you cannot, then tell me now, for I still intend to kill him and will need to be on my way. Elbows on the arms of his red silk-draped throne, he leaned toward her, holding her in his nightmare gaze. My dear Jensen Rahl, sister to Richard Rahl, for a task such as this, I would lay the world at your feet. You have but to ask, and anything within my power shall be yours. Chapter 45 Jensen sat close to Sebastian, drawing comfort from his familiar presence yet wishing they could instead be alone by a campfire, frying up fish or cooking beans. She felt more alone at the Emperor's table, with servants hovering all about, than she'd ever felt by herself in the silence of a forest. Without Sebastian there, laughing and talking, she didn't know what she would have done, how she would have behaved. She was uncomfortable enough around regular people, 
this was far more unnerving. Emperor Jagang was a man who, without effort, fluidly dominated the room. Although he never broke his gracious, courtly manner with her, in some inscrutable way he made her feel that every breath she took had been granted her only by his grace. He referenced momentous matters offhandedly, without realizing he was doing it, so common were such responsibilities, so sure his unflinching rule. He was a mountain lion at rest, sleek and poised, tail swishing lazily, licking his chops. This was not an emperor who was content to sit safely by, back in some remote palace and receive reports. This was an emperor who led his men into the thick of battle. This was an emperor who dug his hands down into the bloody muck of life and death and pulled out what he wanted. Though it seemed an extravagant dinner for what was, after all, an army on the march, it was still the emperor's tent and table and reflected that fact. There was food and drink in abundance, everything from fowl to fish, beef to lamb, wine to water. As servants focused on their tasks, rushed in and out with steaming platters of beautifully prepared food, treating her like royalty, Jensen was struck with a sudden gut-wrenching glimpse of how her mother, as a lowly, obscure, humble young woman, must have felt as she sat at Lord Rawl's table as she saw such tempting variety and abundance as she had never imagined, while at the same time trembling at being in the presence of a man with the power to sentence death without pausing his meal. Jensen had little appetite. She pulled dainty strips of meat off of the succulent piece of pork sitting before her on a thick slab of bread and nibbled as she listened to the two men talk. Their conversation was trivial. Jensen sensed that when she was not around, the two men would have much more to say to each other. As it was, they spoke of acquaintances and caught up on inconsequential matters that had taken place since Sebastian had left the army the previous summer. What of Aiden Drill? Sebastian asked at last as he stabbed a slice of meat on the point of his knife. The emperor twisted a leg off a crispy goose. He planted his elbows on the edge of the table as he leaned forward and gestured vaguely with his prize. I don't know. Sebastian lowered his knife. What do you mean? I remember the lay of the land. You are but a day or two away. His voice was respectful, but clearly concerned. How can you march in without knowing what awaits in Adendril? Jagang tore a big bite off the fat end of the goose leg, the bone spanning the fingers of both hands. Grease dripped from the meat and from his fingers. Well, he said at last, waving the bone over his shoulder before casting it aside on a plate. We sent scouts and patrols to have a look, but none returned. None of them? Concern put an edge on Sebastian's voice. Jagang picked up a knife and sliced off a chunk of lamb from a platter to the side. None, he said as he stabbed the piece of meat. With his teeth, Sebastian eased the bite off his knife and then set the blade down. He rested his elbows on the edge of the table and folded his fingers together as he considered. The wizard's keep is in Aiden Drill, Sebastian said at last, in a quiet voice. I saw it when I scouted the city last year. It sits on the side of a mountain overlooking the city. I remember your report, Jagang answered. Jensen wanted to ask what a wizard's keep was, but not enough to break her silence while the men talked. Besides, it seemed somewhat self-evident, especially by the ominous tone in Sebastian's voice when he said it. Sebastian rubbed his palms together. Then may I ask your plan? The emperor flicked his fingers in command. All the servants vanished. Jensen wished she could go with him, go hide under her blanket and be a proper nobody again. Outside, thunder rumbled and occasional gusts of wind drove fits of rain against the tent. The candles and lamps set about the table lit the two men and the immediate area, but left the soft carpets and walls in near darkness. Emperor Jagang glanced briefly at Jensen before directing his inky gaze to Sebastian. I intend to move in swiftly, not with the whole army, as I believe they will expect, but with a small enough force of cavalry to be maneuverable, yet large enough to maintain control of the situation. Of course, we will take a sizable contingent of the gifted. In the span of those brief words, the mood had turned deadly serious. Jensen sensed that she was silent witness to the pivotal moments of a momentous event. It was frightening to think of the lives that hung in the balance of the words these two men spoke. Sebastian weighed the Emperor's words for a time before speaking. Do you have any idea how Aiden Drill wintered? Jagang shook his head. He pulled a chunk of lamb off the point of his knife and spoke as he chewed. 
The mother confessor is many things. Stupid is not one of them. She would have known for a long time by the direction of our push, by the movements she's observed, by the cities that have already fallen. The path we have chosen. By all the reports and information she would have gathered that with spring I will move on Aden Drill. I've given them a good long time to sweat as they ponder their fate. I suspect that by now they're all shaken in their boots, but I don't think she has the heart to flee. You think that Lord Rawls' wife is there? Jensen blurted out in astonishment. In the city? The mother confessor herself? Both men paused and gazed at her. The tent was silent. Jensen shrank. Forgive me for speaking. The emperor grinned. Why should I forgive you? You've just stuck a knife in the prize goose and called it true. With his blade, he gestured toward Sebastian. You brought a special woman, a woman with a good head on her shoulders. Sebastian rubbed Jensen's back, and a pretty head at that. Jagang's black eyes gleamed as he watched her. Yes, indeed. His fingers blindly scooped olives from a glass bowl to the side. So, Jensen Rao, what is your thinking about all this? Since she had already spoken, she couldn't now decline to answer. She gathered herself and considered the question. Whenever I was hiding from Lord Rawl, I would try not to do anything that would let him know where I was. I tried to do everything I could to keep him blind. Maybe that's what they are doing, too, trying to keep you blind. That's what I was thinking, Sebastian said. If they're terrified, they might try to eliminate any scout or patrol in order to make us think that they're more powerful than they are and to conceal any defensive plans. And keep at least some element of surprise on their side, Jensen added. My thought, too, Jagang said. He grinned at Sebastian. Small wonder you would bring me such a woman. She is a strategist, too. Jagang winked at Jensen, then rang a bell to the side. A woman, the one in the gray dress and tied back gray and black hair, appeared at a distant opening. Yes, Excellency. Bring the young lady some fruits and sweetmeats. As she bowed and left, the Emperor turned serious again. That's why I believe it best to take a smaller force than they are sure to expect, one able to maneuver quickly in response to what defenses they try to catch us up in. They may be able to overpower our small patrols, but not a sizable force of cavalry and gifted. If need be... We can always pour men into the city. After a winter of sitting on their behinds, they would be more than happy to be unleashed. But I'm reluctant to start out with what those in Aedendril are expecting. Sebastian was idly poking a thick slab of roast beef with his knife as he considered. She might be in the confessor's palace. He redirected his gaze to the emperor. The mother confessor very well might have decided to make her stand at long last. I think so too, Emperor Jagang said. Outside, the spring storm had picked up, the chill wind moaning among the tents. Jensen couldn't restrain herself. You really think she will be there? She asked both men. You honestly think she would remain there when she knows you're coming with an enormous army? Jagang shrugged. I can't be sure, of course, but I've battled her all the way up through the Midlands. In the past, she had options, choices, tough though they sometimes were. We drove her army into Aidenjuril just before winter, then sat at her doorstep. Now she and her army have run out of choices, and with the mountains all around, places to flee. Even she knows that a time comes when the choice you are given must be faced. I think this may be where she chooses to at last stand and fight. Sebastian stabbed a portion of meat. It sounds too simple. Of course it does, Jagang said. That's why I must consider that she may have decided to do it. Sebastian gestured north with the red piece of meat on the point of his blade. She may have pulled back into the mountains and left only enough men to take out scouts and patrols to keep you blind, as Jensen suggested. Jagang shrugged. Possibly. She is a woman who is impossible to predict. But she's running out of places to pull back to. Sooner or later, there will be no ground left. This may not be her plan, but then again, it might be so. Jensen hadn't realized that the old world had made such progress at throwing back the enemy. Sebastian, too, had been away a long time. Matters for the old world were not nearly so bleak as she had thought. Still, it sounded a great risk to take based on such thin conjecture. And so you're willing to gamble your men on such a battle, hoping she will be there? Gamble? Jagang sounded amused by the suggestion. Don't you see, it isn't really a gamble at all. 
Either way, we have nothing to lose. Either way, we will have Aiden Drill. In so doing, we finally cleave the Midlands, thus cleaving the entire new world in two. Cleave and conquer is the path to victory. Sebastian licked the blood from his knife. You know her tactics better than I, and are better able to predict what her next will be. But as you say, whether she decides to stand with her people, or leaves them to their fate, we will have the city of Aidendril and the seat of power in the Midlands. The Emperor stared off. That bitch has killed hundreds of thousands of my men. She has always managed to stay one step ahead of me, to stay out of my grip, but all the while she was backing toward the wall. This wall. He looked up in cold rage. May the Creator grant that I have her at last. His knuckles were white around the handle of his knife, his voice a deadly oath. I will have her, and I will settle the score, personally. Sebastian measured the look in the Emperor's dark eyes. Then perhaps we are near to the final victory, in the Midlands at least. With the Midlands won, the fate of Dahara will be sealed. He held his knife up. And if the Mother Confessor is there, then Lord Rahl very well might be too. Jensen, thoughts tumbling through her mind, looked from Sebastian to the Emperor. You mean you think that her husband, Lord Rahl, is there too? Jagang's nightmare gaze turned toward her as he grinned wickedly. Exactly, darling. Jensen felt a chill run up her spine at the murderous look in his eyes. She was grateful to the good spirits that she was on this man's side and not his enemy. Still, she had to voice the vital information Tom had told her. She felt a stab of anguish, wishing it had been someone other than Tom who had confirmed it for her, but it was Sebastian who was really the first one to have told her about it. Lord Rahl can't be there in Aiden Drill. Both men stared at her. Lord Rahl is far to the south. Jagang frowned. To the south? What do you mean? He's in the old world. Are you sure? Sebastian asked. Jensen puzzled at him. You told me so yourself, that he led his army of invasion into the old world. A look of recollection came over Sebastian's face. Yes, of course, Jen, but that was long before I even met you, way back before I left our troops that I had heard those reports. That was a long time ago. But I know he was in the old world after that. What do you mean? Jagang asked in a gravelly growl. Jensen cleared her throat. The bond. The Daharan people feel a bond to the Lord Rahl. And do you feel the bond? Jagang asked. Well, no, it just isn't strong enough in me. But when Sebastian and I were at the People's Palace, I met people there who said that Lord Rahl was far to the south in the old world. The Emperor considered her words as he glanced over at a woman who had come in with platters of dried fruits, sweetmeats, and nuts. She worked at a distant side table, apparently not wanting to come any closer and disturb the Emperor and his guests. But, Jen, you heard that last winter, when we were at the palace. Have you heard anyone with the bond confirm it since then? Jensen shook her head. I guess not. If the Mother Confessor intends to make her stand in Aiden Drill, Sebastian said thoughtfully, then it's possible, since we last had this report of him to the south, that he's come north to stand by the Mother Confessor. Jagang leaned in low over the bloody meat before him. Those two are like that, evil to the end. I've dealt with them both for a long time now. I know from experience that if there's any way for them to be together, they will be, even if it's in death. The implications were staggering. Then we might have him, Jensen whispered almost to herself. We might have Richard Rahl, too. The nightmare might be close to over. We could be on the eve of victory for all of us. Jagang leaned back, drumming his fingers on the table, looking from one to the other. While I find it hard to believe Richard Rahl would also be there, from what I know about him... He could well decide to stand and lose with her, rather than live to see it all slip away from him bit by bloody bit. Jensen felt an unexpected pang at the thought of the two of them standing together as the end came. It was completely out of character for a Lord Rahl to care for any woman, much less to stand by one as she was about to lose the war for her homeland and her life as well. Lord Rahl would be more concerned about preserving his own life and land. Still... The thought of him being this close was too tantalizing to dismiss, and had her pulse racing. If he is this close, then I wouldn't need the help of the Sisters of the Light. I wouldn't need a spell. I would only have to get a little closer, to be with you when you make your drive into the city. Jagang's grim, humorless smile was back. You will ride with me, 
I will deliver you to the confessor's palace. His knuckles were white around his knife again. I want them both dead. I will see to the mother confessor personally. I grant you permission to be the one to plunge your knife into Richard Rall. Jensen felt a wild swing of emotion from giddy elation that the deed was close at hand to sickening horror. For an instant, she doubted she could really carry out such a grisly, cold-blooded act. Jensen! But then she remembered her mother lying in a pool of blood on the floor of their home, bleeding to death from those awful ripping stab wounds, her severed arm not far away, a house full of Lord Rawls' brutes standing over her. Jensen remembered her mother's eyes as she lay dying. She remembered how helpless she felt as her mother's life slipped away. The horror of it was as fresh as ever. The rage was as white-hot as ever. Jensen lusted to plunge her knife into her bastard brother's heart. That was all she wanted. In the searing haze of righteous anger, as she saw herself slamming the knife into Richard Rawls' chest, she only distantly heard Jagang speak. But why is it you wish to kill your brother? What is your reason, your purpose? Grushdeva, she hissed. Behind her, Jensen heard a glass vase hit the floor and shatter. The sound startled her back to where she was. The emperor frowned at the woman off in the shadows. Her brown eyes were fixed on Jensen. I apologize for Sister Perdita's clumsiness, Jagang said as he glared at the woman. Forgive me, Excellency, the woman in the dark gray dress said as she backed out between the hangings, bowing all the way. The emperor's frown turned back to Jensen. Now, what was it you said? Jensen hadn't the slightest idea. She knew she'd said something, but she wasn't sure what. She thought that maybe her grief had tied her tongue in knots right when she went to answer. Her sorrow returned like a great grim weight on her shoulders. You see, Excellency, Jensen said as she stared down at her uneaten dinner. All my life, my father, Darkin Rall, has been trying to murder me because I was his ungifted offspring. When Richard Rall killed him and assumed rule over Dahara, he took up in his father's place, and part of that place was to murder his ungifted siblings. But in this duty he was even more vicious than his father had been. Jensen looked up through watery vision. Just after I met Sebastian, my brother's men finally caught up with us. They brutally murdered my mother. If not for Sebastian being there, they would have had me too. Sebastian saved my life. I intend to kill Richard, because if I don't, I can't ever be free. He will always send men to hunt me. Besides saving my life, Sebastian helped me to see that. Perhaps even more importantly, I must avenge the murder of my mother if I am ever to be at peace. Our purpose is the welfare of our fellow man. Your story saddens me, and is the very reason we fight to eradicate the blight of magic. The Emperor finally shifted his gaze to Sebastian. I am proud of you for helping this fine young woman. Sebastian had turned moody. She knew how ill at ease he felt under the weight of praise. She wished he could feel proud about his accomplishments, his importance, his stature with the Emperor. He laid his knife down across the scraps of his meal. Just doing my job, Excellency. Well, Jagang said with an encouraging smile, I'm glad you've returned in time to see the culmination of your strategy. Sebastian leaned back, nursing a mug of ale. Don't you want to wait for Brother Nariv? Shouldn't he be here to witness it, if this turns out to be the blow that ends it? With a thick finger, Jagang pushed an olive around in a little circle on the table. It was a time before he spoke quietly without looking up. I've not heard from Brother Nariv since Altur Rang fell. Sebastian came up against the table. What? Altur Rang fell? What do you mean? How? When? Jensen knew that Altur Rang was the Emperor's homeland, the city he came from. Sebastian had told her that Brother Nariv and the Fellowship of Order were there in that great shining city of hope for mankind. A great palace would be built there in homage to the Creator and as a symbol to solidify the unity of the old world. I received reports not long ago that enemy forces overran the city. Al-Turang is very distant, and it was cut off. Partly because of winter, the reports were a very long time in reaching me. I await news. Given this inauspicious turn of fate, I don't think it wise to wait for Brother Nariv to make it up here. He will be busy throwing the invaders back. If the Mother Confessor and Richard Rall are in Adendria, we must not wait. 
We must strike back swiftly and with withering force. Jensen laid a sympathetic hand on Sebastian's forearm. That must have been what you told me about. When I first met you, and you told me that Lord Rahl was invading your homeland, that must have been what he was after. All tour wrong. Sebastian stared at her. It may be that he isn't an Aiden Drill. It may turn out that he's still to the south, Jen, in the old world. You have to keep that in mind. I don't want you to invest all your hopes only to have them dashed. I hope he is here, and it could finally be ended. But as His Excellency said about moving on Aiden Drill, there is nothing to lose. I didn't expect to find him here. If he isn't an Aiden Drill, then I'll still have the help for which you brought me here in the first place. And what is the nature of that help? Jagang asked. Sebastian answered for her. I told her that the sisters might be able to help with a spell, so that she can get past all of Lord Rawl's protection and get close enough to him to act. One way or another, then. If he is in Aidendrill, you shall have him. Jagang plucked up the olive he had been rolling around and popped it in his mouth. If not, then you shall have the sorceress at your disposal. Whatever help you need from the sisters is yours. You have but to ask, and they will provide it. My word on that. His raven eyes were deadly serious. Outside, thunder rumbled. The rain had picked up. Lightning flickered, lighting the tent from the outside with eerie light that made the candlelight seem all the darker when each flash of lightning ended, leaving them again in near darkness, waiting for the roll of thunder. I just need them to cast me a spell to divert those protecting him so I can get close enough to him, Jensen said after the thunder had died out. She drew her knife from its sheath and held it up to look at the ornate letter R engraved in the silver handle. Then I can put my knife through his evil heart. This knife, his own knife. Sebastian explained how important it is to use what is closest to an enemy to strike back at them. Sebastian has spoken wisely. That is our way. And why, with the Creator's guidance, we will prevail. Let us pray that we at last have them both, and it can finally be ended, that the scourge of magic will finally be ended, and that mankind will at last be allowed to live in peace as the Creator intended. Jensen and Sebastian both nodded at the invocation. If we catch them in Aiden Drill, Jagang said, looking her in the eyes, I promise that you will be the one to put your blade through his heart so that your mother may finally rest in peace. Thank you, Jensen whispered in gratitude. He didn't ask how she could accomplish such a task. Maybe the conviction in her voice had betrayed the fact that there was more to this than he knew that she had some special advantage that would enable her to accomplish such a thing. And there was more to this than he knew, or Sebastian knew. Jensen had been thinking long and hard about it, putting all the various elements together. Her whole life had been devoted to thinking about this problem, but in the past her thoughts always revolved around how insoluble it was, how it was only a matter of time until Lord Rahl caught her and the nightmare began in earnest. She had always been focused on the problem. Now, since meeting Sebastian and the death of her mother, events had accelerated at a breathtaking pace. But those events had also added bit by bit to her understanding of the larger picture. Questions were beginning to have answers, answers that seemed so simple now, looking back on them. She almost felt as if, deep down inside, she must have known all along. Now she was turning her focus away from the problem, she was beginning to think in terms of the solution. Jensen had learned a great deal from Althea, as it turned out more even than the sorceress knew she was revealing. A sorceress of Althea's power would not be trapped there all those years unless what she said about the beasts in the swamp were true. The snake was different. Friedrich had said that the snake was just a snake. But the beasts were magic. Those beasts kept even a sorceress of Althea's power locked in her prison. Friedrich said that no one, not even he, could come in by the back way. Tom had also said that he had never heard of anyone going in the back way and returning to tell about it. No one used the meadow either because of the things that came out of that swamp. The things in the swamp were real and they were deadly. All the facts but one were consistent in supporting that. Jensen had gone in and come out again without ever being approached, much less attacked or harmed. She had seen nothing of any beasts created from the very substance of the gift. That was the one piece that hadn't fit at the time. It did now. 
There had been other indications, too, such as in the People's Palace, when Jensen had touched Nida's Aegeal without it harming her. It had certainly harmed both Sebastian and Captain Lerner. Nida had been dumbstruck. She had said that not even Lord Rawl was immune to the touch of an Aegeal. Jensen was. And Jensen had been able to bend Nida's will to helping, rather than what by all rights she should have done, which was to stop this stranger who couldn't be touched with the power of an Aegeal, stopped a woman who raised so many unanswered questions until it all could be sorted out and confirmed. Even when Nathan Rawl tried to stop her, Jensen had been able to get Nida to help protect her from a gifted Rawl. Jensen knew now that it was more than just a good bluff. A bluff might have been the colonel, but there was much more wrapped around it. All of those things and more over the course of the long and difficult journey to Aidendril had at last come together so that Jensen finally saw the true extent of her unique status and why she was the one to kill Richard Rawl. Jensen had come to understand that she was the only one able to do this, that she was born to do this, because, in a central, critical, cardinal way, she was invincible. She knew now that she had always been invincible. Chapter 46 From atop Rusty, the chill, gusty breeze ruffling her hair, Jensen gazed off at the splendor of the Confessor's palace, crowning a distant rise. Sebastian sat beside her on a nervous peat. Emperor Jagang, his magnificent, dappled gray stallion pawing the road, waited on the other side of Sebastian, a cadre of officers and advisors huddled close, but silent. Jagang's forbidding scowl was fixed on the palace. Dark, menacing shapes like a gathering storm drifted across the surface of his black eyes. The advance into Aidendril had, so far, been unlike anything anyone had expected, leaving everyone tense and on edge. Arrayed behind was a contingent of Sisters of the Light who kept to themselves, apparently concentrating on matters of magic. Although none of the Sisters as of yet had had the chance to speak to Jensen, they were all acutely aware of her and kept a close eye on her. Yet more of them had ridden off in various directions as the Emperor had led the detachment of Imperial Order cavalry, like some dark floodwater across farms, roads, and hills, around buildings and barns, ever onward up roads, and then in around buildings to seep into the outermost fringes of Aidendril. The great city now lay spread out before them, silent and still. The night before, Sebastian had slept fitfully. Jensen knew because on the eve of such a momentous battle, she had slept hardly at all. Yet with the thought of finally being able to use the knife sheathed at her belt, she was wide awake. Behind the sisters, more than 40,000 of the Imperial Order's elite cavalry waited, some with pikes and lances poised at the ready, some with swords or axes in hand. Each wore a ring through his left nostril, while most wore beards and some had long, dark, greasy hair, with good luck charms tied in. There were quite a few with shaved heads, apparently out of open fealty to Emperor Jagang. They were all a tightly coiled spring, destroyers poised to storm into the city. Besides being elite members of the cavalry, trusted officers, or sisters of the light, every person there, except Jensen and Sebastian, had one essential thing in common. They knew the Mother Confessor by sight. From what Jensen was able to gather, the Mother Confessor had led raids on the Order's camp and had been at battles where she had been seen by a number of the men as well as the sisters. All those chosen to ride into Aidendril with the Emperor had to know the Mother Confessor by sight. Jagang didn't want her slipping out of their snare by hiding in crowds of people or escaping by pretending to be a lowly washwoman. Such a worry had evaporated in the light of what they had so far found. Chilled not only by the breeze, but by the lust for battle gleaming in the soldier's eyes, Jensen gripped the horn of her saddle tight in an attempt to make her hand stop trembling. Jensen! For the hundredth time that morning, she checked that her knife was clear in its scabbard. After reassuring herself, she pressed it back down, feeling the satisfying metallic click as it seated. She was there with the army because she was a part of this, with a job to do. Surrender! She thought about the irony of how this was the very knife that Lord Rahl had given a man he sent to kill her, and now she was bringing that same knife, a thing close to him, back to defeat him. At last she was the hunter and not the hunted. 
Whenever she felt her courage waver, she had but to think of her mother, or Althea and Friedrich, or Althea's sister, Lethea, or even Jensen's unknown half-brother, the Rog Moss healer, Drefen. So many lives had been ruined or forfeit because of the house of Rall, because of Lord Rall, first her father, Darken Rall, and now her half-brother, Richard Rall. Surrender your will, Jensen. Surrender your flesh. Leave me be, she snapped, annoyed that the voice wouldn't leave her alone, and at having to repeat it so often when she had important things on her mind. Sebastian frowned over at her. What? Chagrined that she had inadvertently said it aloud this time, Jensen simply shook her head as if to say it was nothing. He turned back to his own thoughts as he watched the city spread out before them, studying the imposing maze of tight buildings, streets, and alleyways. There was only one thing missing from the city, and that had everyone tense and jumpy. From the corner of her eye, Jensen saw the sisters all whispering among themselves, all except one, Sister Perdita, the one in the dark gray dress and the salt and pepper hair loosely tied back. When their eyes met, the woman smiled in that knowing, self-satisfied smirk of hers that seemed able to look right into Jensen's soul. Jensen thought that it probably looked different to her than the woman intended, so she bowed her head slightly in acknowledgement and smiled all the smile she could muster before turning away. Along with everyone else, Jensen watched the palace in the distance on a hill overlooking the city. It was hard not to look at it, the way it stood out against the gray walls of mountains like snow on slate. Tall windows fronted the building between towering white marble columns topped with gold capitals. To the rear, at the center, a domed roof with a belt of windows rose up well clear of the high walls. Jensen had trouble reconciling the splendor of such a beautiful building with the wicked rule of the Mother Confessor. The sinister specter of the wizard's keep, high up on a mountain behind the palace, seemed like it would be more fitting for the Mother Confessor. Jensen noticed that no one liked looking up at that baleful place. Their eyes were always quick to turn to less unnerving sights. The keep watching down on them was larger than any man-made thing Jensen had ever seen, save the People's Palace in Dahara. Ragged gray clouds floated past dark stone exterior walls that soared to staggering heights. The keep itself, behind those lofty walls, appeared to be a complex collection of battlements, ramparts, crenellated walls, towers, spires, and connecting bridges and walkways. Jensen had never imagined that anything made of stone could look so alive with menace. In the quiet, her gaze sought solace in Sebastian's spikes of white hair, his knowing eyes, the familiar contours of his face. His handsome features were comforting to her, even if he didn't look her way. What woman wouldn't be honored to have the love of a man like him? If not for him being there with her since her mother's death, Jensen didn't know what she would have done, how she would have gotten by. Sebastian wore his cloak laid back to expose some of his weapons. He surveyed the scene with studied calm. She wished she could feel so calm. It frightened her, unexpectedly, to contemplate him having to draw those weapons, of him having to fight for his life. What do you think, she whispered as she leaned closer to him. What could it mean? He gave her a brief shake of his head along with a harsh glance. He didn't want to discuss it. That curt gesture told her that she was supposed to be quiet. She had known, of course, by the silence of tens of thousands of men right behind her that she was supposed to be quiet. But the anxiety was twisting her insides into a knot. She had only wanted a small token of reassurance. Instead, his abrupt snub cut her down, making her feel like a small nobody. She knew that he had important things on his mind, but his brusque dismissal still stung like a slap, especially after the night before when he had so desperately wanted her comfort, wanted her as fiercely as he had ever wanted her. She had understood. She hadn't turned him away even though she found it distressing that they weren't alone, but had guards standing right outside who she suspected could hear everything. Of course, she knew that this was not the time or place he could afford to give her comfort. They were all on the brink of battle. Still, it hurt. Over the sound of the wind moaning through the bare branches of majestic, mature maple trees lining the road, she picked up the sound of hooves at a gallop. All eyes turned to watch bearded, long-haired men, streamers of fur and hides trailing out behind as they hunched forward over their horses' withers, charging in from the road on the right. Jensen recognized them by the lead horse's patchy white pied coloration. They were one of the small reconnoitering parties the emperor had sent ahead hours before. In the distance to the west, their counterpart was returning from the opposite direction, but they were yet tiny specks riding down out of the far foothills. 
As the first group of horsemen came storming in before the emperor and his advisors, Jensen covered her mouth with the edge of her cloak to mask her coughing on the cloud of dust. The husky man at the lead of the riders pulled his pied horse around. His greasy strings of hair whipped around like the horse's white tail. Nothing, Excellency. Jagang, looking in a foul mood and near the end of his patience, shifted his weight in his saddle. Nothing. No, Excellency, nothing. No sign of troops anywhere to the east or on the far side of the city or all the way up the slopes of the mountains. Nothing. The roads, the trails, all deserted. No people, no tracks, no horse dung, no wagon ruts, nothing. We could find no sign that anyone had been here for a good long time. The man went on with a detailed account of where they had looked, but without result, as the other knot of men thundered in from the west, their horses lathered and in a high state of excitement. No one, the man at the front called out as he hauled in on the reins, laying his horse's head over. The horse, eyes wild and keyed up from the hard ride, pivoted around to a halt before the emperor, snorting through flared nostrils. Excellency, there are no troops or anyone to the west. Jagang glared at the confessor's palace. What about the road up to the keep, he asked in a quiet growl. Or are you going to tell me that my scouts and patrols were ambushed by the ghosts of all the vanished people? The brawny man layered in hides looked as fierce as anyone Jensen had ever seen. His top teeth were missing, adding to his savage aspect. He cast a cautious look back up at the wide ribbon of road that wound its way up from the city toward the wizard's keep. He turned back to the emperor. Excellency, there were no tracks on the road up to the keep either. Did you go all the way up to the keep to check, he asked, his dark gaze turning on the man. The man swallowed under the hot scrutiny of Jagang's glower. There is a stone bridge not far from the top that crosses a great crevasse. We went that far, Excellency, but still saw no one, nor any tracks. The portcullis was lowered. Beyond, the keep showed no sign of life. That means nothing, a woman not far behind scoffed. Jensen turned, along with Sebastian, most of the advisors, officers, and Jagang, to look at her. It was Sister Perdita who had spoken. At least she managed to keep most of the superior smirk off her face as everyone stared at her. It means nothing, she repeated. I'm telling you, Excellency, I don't like this one bit. Something is wrong. Something like what? Jagang asked, his voice low and surly. Sister Perdita left the company of several dozen Sisters of the Light and walked her horse forward to speak more privately to the Emperor. Excellency, she said only after she was close, have you ever walked into a wood and realized that there were no sounds, when there should be, that it had suddenly gone quiet? Jensen had. She was struck by how accurately the sister had hit upon the peculiar, uneasy feeling she was having, a kind of portent to doom, yet without definable cause, that made the fine hairs at the back of her neck stand on end like when she would be lying in her bedroll almost asleep, and every insect all at once went silent. Jagang glared at Sister Perdita. When I walk into a wood or anywhere, it always goes silent. The sister didn't argue, but simply started over. Excellency, we have fought these people long and hard. Those of us with the gift know their tricks with magic. We know when they are using their gift. We've learned to know if they've used magic to set traps, even if those traps are not themselves magic. But this is different. Something is wrong. You still have not told me what, Jagang said, with restrained, impatient irritation, as if he didn't have time for someone who wouldn't come to the point. The woman, noting his annoyance, bowed her head. Excellency, I would tell you if I knew. It is my duty to advise you of what I know. We can detect no magic being used. None. We sense no traps that have ever been touched by the gift. But that knowledge still does not set my mind at ease. Something is wrong. I'm telling you now, my warning, even though I admit that I don't know the cause of my concern. You have but to search my mind for yourself, and you will see I'm speaking the truth. Jensen had no idea what the sister meant, but after staring at her for a moment, Jagang visibly cooled. He grunted dismissively as he looked back toward the palace. I think you're just nervous after a long, idle winter, sister. As you said, you know their tactics and tricks with magic. So if it was something real, you and your sisters would know it and know the cause. I'm not sure that's true, Sister Perdita pressed. She cast a quick, troubled glance at the wizard's keep up on the mountain. Excellency, we know a great deal about magic. But the keep is thousands of years old. Being from the old world, that place is outside my experience. 
I know next to nothing about the specific kinds of magic which are likely to be kept in that place, except that whatever magic is kept there will be dangerous in the extreme. That is one purpose of a keep, to safeguard such things. That's why I want the keep taken, Jigang shot back. Those dangerous things must not be left in the enemy's hands to later deal us murder. With her fingertips, Sister Perdita patiently rubbed the creases in her brow. The keep is strongly warded. I can't tell how. The wards were set by wizards, not sorceresses. Such wards could easily have been left untended. No one need stand guard. Such wards can be triggered by simple trespass, much as with any trap without magic. Such wards can be cautionary, but just as likely they can be deadly. Even if the place is deserted, those wards could easily kill anyone. Anyone who so much as tries to get close, much less take the place. Such defensive measures are timeless. They do not wear away. They are just as effective whether they've been there for a month or a millennia. The attempt to take a place so warded could deal us the murder we are trying to avoid. Jigang nodded as he listened. We still must untangle those wards so we can gain the keep. Sister Perdita glanced over her shoulder at the dark stone keep far up on the mountainside before she spoke. Excellency, as I have often tried to explain, our degree of ability and aggregate power doesn't mean we can untangle or defeat those wards. Such a thing is not directly relational. A bear, strong as he is, can't open a lock on a strong box. Strength isn't necessarily the key to such things. I'm telling you that I don't like this, that something is wrong. You have told me only that you are afraid. Of all those with magic, the sisters are exceptionally well armed. That is the reason you're here. Jagang leaned toward the woman, his patience appearing to be at an end. I expect the sisters to stop any threat from magic. Must I make it any more clear? Sister Perdita paled. No, Excellency. After a bow from her saddle, she pulled her horse around to rejoin her sisters. Sister Perdita! Jagang called after her. He waited until she turned back. As I've told you before, we must gain the wizard's keep. I don't care how many of you it takes, only that it gets done. As she returned to her sisters to discuss the matter, Jagang, along with everyone else, caught sight of a lone rider racing toward them from the city. Something about the look on the man's face had everyone checking their weapons. They all waited in tense silence until his horse skidded to a stop before the emperor. The man was drenched in sweat, and his narrow-set eyes were wide with excitement, but he kept his voice under control. Excellency, I saw no one, no one in the city, but I smelled horses. Jensen saw apprehension etched on the faces of the officers at this further confirmation of their disbelief of the preposterous notion that the city was deserted. The order had driven the enemy forces to Aidendrill as winter had descended, trapping not only the army but the people of the city as well. How a place this large could be evacuated in the dead of winter was beyond their imagination. Yet no one seemed willing to voice that conviction too strongly to the emperor as he stared out upon an empty city. Horses? Jagang frowned. Maybe it was a stable. No, Excellency. I could not find them nor hear them, but I could smell them. It was not the smell of a stable, but horses. There are horses there. Then the enemy is here just as we thought, one of the officers said to Jagang. They're hiding, but they're here. Jagang said nothing as he waited for the man to go on. Excellency, there is more, the burly soldier said, nearly bursting with excitement. As I searched, I could not find the horses anywhere, so I decided to return for more men to help ferret out the cowardly enemy. As I was returning, I saw someone in a window of the palace. Jagang's gaze abruptly turned to the man. What? The soldier pointed. In the White Palace, Excellency. As I rode out from behind a wall at the edge of the city, before the palace grounds, I saw someone on the second floor move away from a window. With an angry yank on the reins, Jagang checked his stallion's impatient sidesteps. Are you sure? The man nodded vigorously. Yes, Excellency, the windows there are tall. On my life, just as I came out from behind the wall and looked up, someone saw me and moved back from a window. The Emperor peered intently up the road lined with maple trees toward the palace as he considered this new development. Man or woman, Sebastian asked. The rider paused to wipe sweat from his eyes and to swallow in an effort to catch his breath. It was the briefest look, but I believe it was a woman. Jagang turned his dark glare on the man. Was it her? The maple branches clattered together in the gusts as all eyes watched the man. 
Excellency, I could not tell for certain. It might have been a reflection of the light on the window. But in that brief look, I thought I saw that she was wearing a long white dress. The mother confessor wore a white dress. Jensen thought it was pretty far-fetched to believe it could be a coincidence that there would be a reflection on the glass right as a person moved away from the window, a reflection that made it look like they were wearing the white dress of the mother confessor. Yet it made no sense to Jensen. Why would the mother confessor be alone in her palace? Making a last stand was one thing. Making it alone was quite another. Could it be, as the man suggested, that the enemy was cowardly and hiding? Sebastian idly tapped a finger against his thigh. I wonder what they're up to. Jagang drew his sword. I guess we'll find out. He looked then at Jensen. Keep that knife of yours handy, girl. This may be the day you've been praying for. But, Excellency, how could it possibly... The Emperor stood in his stirrups and flashed a wicked grin back to his cavalry. He circled his sword high in the air. The coiled spring was unleashed. With a deafening roar... Forty thousand men loosed a pent-up battle cry as they charged away. Jensen gasped and held on to Rusty for dear life as the horse leaped into a gallop ahead of the cavalry racing toward the palace. Chapter 47 Nearly out of breath, Jensen bent forward over Rusty, stretching her arms out to each side of the horse's neck to give her all the reins she needed as they charged at a full gallop out of the fringes of the countryside toward the sprawling city of Adendril. The roar of 40,000 men yelling battle cries along with the thundering hooves was as frightening as it was deafening. Yet the rush of it all, the heart-pounding sensation of wild abandon, was also intoxicating. Not that she didn't grasp the enormity, the horror of what was happening, but some small part of her couldn't help being swept up with the intense emotion of being a part of it all. Fierce men with bloodlust in their eyes fanned out to the sides as they raced ahead. The air seemed alive with light flashing off all the swords and axes held high, the sharpened points of lances and pikes piercing the muted morning air. The scintillating sights, the swell of sounds, the swirling passions all filled Jensen with the hunger to draw her knife, but she didn't. She knew the time would come. Sebastian rode near her, making sure she was safe and didn't become lost in the crazy, headlong, willful stampede. The voice rode with her, too, and would not remain silent despite how she tried to ignore it or begged in her mind for it to leave her be. She needed to focus on what was happening, on what might soon happen. She couldn't afford the distraction, not now. As it called her name, called for her to surrender her will, to surrender her flesh, called to her in mysterious but strangely seductive words, the surrounding roar of masking sound gave Jensen the anonymity to finally scream at the top of her lungs, Let me be! Leave me alone! Without anyone noticing. It was a heady purification to be able to banish the voice with such unrestrained force and authority. In what seemed an instant, they suddenly plunged into the city, leaping over fences, skirting poles, and flying past buildings with bewildering speed. With the way they had been in the open and then abruptly had to deal with all the things around them, it reminded her of racing into a stand of woods. The wild charge was not what she had imagined it would be, an ordered, marshaled run across open ground, but instead was a mad dash through a great city, along wide thoroughfares lined with magnificent buildings, then veering suddenly down dark, canyon-like alleys made of tall stone walls that in some places bridged the narrow slice of open sky overhead, and then abruptly impetuous dashes through warrens of narrow, twisting side streets among ancient windowless buildings laid out to no design. There was no slowing for deliberation or decision, but rather it was one long, reckless, relentless rush. It was made all the more surreal because there were no people anywhere, there should have been crowds scattering in wild panic, diving out of the way, screaming. In her mind's eye, she overlaid scenes she had seen in cities before. Peddlers pushing carts with everything from fish to fine linen, shopkeepers outside their businesses tending tables of bread, cheese, meat, wine, craftsmen displaying shoes, clothes, wigs, and leather goods, windows filled with wares. Now all those windows were strangely empty, some boarded up, some just left as if the owner would be opening any minute. All the windows lining their route stood empty. Streets, benches, parks were mute witness to the onslaught of cavalry. 
It was frightening to charge at full speed through the convoluted maze of streets, cutting around buildings and obstacles, dashing down dirt alleyways, flying at full speed along curving cobblestone roads, cresting rises only to plummet down the far side, like some bizarre, headlong, out-of-control snow sled ride plunging down an icy hill through the trees, and just as dangerous. Sometimes, as they galloped half a dozen abreast, the way suddenly narrowed with a wall or a corner of a building that stuck out. More than one rider went down with calamitous results. Buildings, colors, fences, poles, and intersecting streets flashed by in a dizzying array. Without the resistance of an enemy force, the unbridled rush felt to Jensen like it was out of all control, yet she knew that these were the elite cavalry, so a wanton charge was their specialty. Besides, Emperor Jigang looked in complete control atop his magnificent stallion. The horses kicked up a shower of sod as they suddenly broke past a wide opening in a wall to find themselves charging up the expansive lawns of the Confessor's Palace. The fury of yelling riders spread out to each side, their horses tearing up the picturesque setting, the crude and filthy bloodthirsty invaders defiling the deceptively serene beauty of the grounds. Jensen rode beside Sebastian not far behind the Emperor and several of his officers between widespread flanks of howling men straight up the wide promenade lined with mature maple trees, their bare branches heavy with buds laced together overhead. Despite everything she had learned, everything she knew, everything she held dear, Jensen couldn't understand why she felt such a sense of being a participant in a profane violation. The impression melted away as she focused her attention instead on something she spotted ahead. It stood not far from the wide marble steps leading up to the grand entrance of the Confessor's Palace. It looked like a lone pole with something atop it. A long red cloth tied near the top of the shaft of the pole flew and flapped in the breeze, as if waving to them, calling for their attention, giving them all at last a destination. Emperor Jagang led the charge directly toward that pole with its red flag flying. As they raced across the lawns, she concentrated on the heat of Rusty's obedient and powerful muscles flexing beneath her, finding reassurance in her horse's familiar movements. Jensen couldn't help gazing up at the white marble columns towering above them. It was a majestic entrance, imposing yet elegant and welcoming. This day the Imperial Order was at last to own the place where evil had for so long ruled unopposed. Emperor Jagang held his sword high, signaling the cavalry to halt. The cheering, yelling, screaming battle cries died out as tens of thousands of men all at once brought their excited horses down from a charge to a stop. It amazed her what with so many men with weapons out that it all happened in seconds and without carnage. Jensen patted the side of Rusty's neck before sliding down off her horse. She hit the ground among a confusion of men, mostly officers and advisors, but regular cavalry too, all swarming in to protect the Emperor. She had never been this close in among the regular soldiers before. They were intimidating as they eyed her in their midst. They all seemed impatient for an enemy to fight. The men were a filthy, grimy lot and smelled worse than their horses. For some reason, it was that suffocating, sweaty, foul stink that frightened her the most. Sebastian's hand seized her arm and pulled her close. Are you all right? Jensen nodded, trying to see the Emperor and what had stopped him. Sebastian tried to see as well, pulling her along with him as he stepped through a screen of burly officers. Seeing it was him, they made way. She and Sebastian halted when they saw the Emperor standing several paces ahead, alone, his back to them, his shoulders slumped, his sword hanging from his fist at his side. It appeared that all his men were afraid to approach him. Jensen, with Sebastian quickly moving to catch up, closed the distance to reach Emperor Jagang. He stood frozen before the spear planted butt-end in the ground. He stared with those completely black eyes as if seeing an apparition. Tied beneath the long, barbed, razor-sharp metal point of the spear, the long red cloth flapped in the otherwise complete silence. Atop the spear was a man's head. Jensen winced at the arresting sight. The gaunt head, severed cleanly at mid-neck, looked almost alive. The dark eyes beneath a deeply hooded brow were fixed in an unblinking stare. A dark, creased cap rested halfway down the forehead. Somehow, the austere cap pressed down on the head seemed to match the severe countenance of the man. Wisps of wiry hair curled out from above his ears to ruffle in the wind. 
It seemed as if the thin lips at any moment might give them a forbidding smile from the world of the dead. The face looked as if the man in life had been as grim as death itself. The way Emperor Jagang stood stupefied, staring at the head right before him impaled on the point of the spear, and the way not one of the thousands of men so much as coughed had Jensen's heart hammering faster than when she had been riding Rusty at a reckless gallop. Jensen cautiously peered over at Sebastian. He, too, stood stunned. Her fingers tightened on his arm in sympathy for the look in his wide, tearful eyes. He finally leaned closer to her in order to whisper in a choked voice, Brother Nariv. The shock of those two barely audible words hit Jensen like a slap. It was the great man himself, the spiritual leader of the entire old world, Emperor Jagang's friend and closest personal advisor, a man who Sebastian believed was closer to the Creator than any man who had ever been born, a man whose teachings Sebastian religiously lived by, dead, his head impaled on a spear. The Emperor reached out and pulled free a small folded piece of paper that was stuck in the side of Brother Narev's cap. As Jensen watched Jagang's thick fingers open the carefully folded small piece of paper, it reminded her unexpectedly of the way she had unfolded the paper she had found on the Daharan soldier that fateful day she had discovered him lying dead at the bottom of the ravine, the day she had met Sebastian, the day before Lord Raoul's men had finally located her and killed her mother. Emperor Jagang lifted the paper out to silently read what it said. For a frightening long time, he just stared at the paper. At last, his arm lowered to his side. His chest heaved with a terrible, burgeoning wrath as he stared once more at Brother Narev's head on the end of the spear. In a smoldering voice, bitter with indignation, Jagang repeated the words from the note just loud enough for those standing close to hear. Compliments of Richard Rao. The stiff wind moaned through a stand of nearby trees. No one said a word as they all waited on Emperor Jagang for direction. Jensen's nose wrinkled at a foul smell. She looked up to see the head, so perfect only moments before, beginning to putrefy before her very eyes. The flesh sagged heavily, the bottom eyelids drooped, revealing their red undersides, the jaw sank, the thin line of the mouth opened, almost looking as if the head were letting out a scream. Jensen along with everyone else, including Emperor Jagang, took a step back as the flesh of the face decayed in sudden ghastly ruptures, revealing festering tissue beneath. The tongue swelled as the jaw dropped lower. The eyeballs sank forward out of their sockets as they shriveled. Reeking flesh fell away in clumps. What would have been long months of decomposition took place in a matter of seconds, leaving the skull beneath that creased cap grinning at them through tattered bits of hanging flesh. It had a web of magic around it, Excellency, Sister Perdita said, almost sounding as if she were answering a question unspoken. Jensen hadn't heard her come up behind them. The spell preserved it in that condition until you pulled the note from the cap, triggering the dissolution of the magic preserving it. Once that magic was withdrawn, the remains went through the decomposition that would ordinarily have taken place. Emperor Jagang was staring at her with cold, dark eyes. What he might be thinking, Jensen couldn't be sure, but she could see the fury building within those nightmare eyes. It was a very complex and powerful ward that preserved it until the right person touched it, to pull the note free, Sister Perdita said in a quiet voice. The ward was likely keyed to your touch, Excellency. For a long, terrifying moment, Jensen feared that Emperor Jagang might suddenly swing his sword with a wild cry and behead the woman. To the side, an officer suddenly pointed up at the confessor's palace. Look, it's her! Dear Creator, Sebastian whispered, as he too looked up and saw someone in the window. Other men yelled that they saw her too. Jensen rose up on tiptoes, trying to see around the tall soldiers rushing forward and the officers pointing past the reflections on the glass to the person she saw back within the dark interior. She shielded her eyes, trying to see better. Men whispered excitedly, There! Another officer on the other side of Jagang cried out, Look! It's Lord Rawl! There! It's Lord Rawl! Jensen froze from the jolt of those words. It didn't seem real. She ran the man's words through her mind again. So shocking were they to hear that she felt she had to check again if it really was what she thought she had heard. There! Another man yelled. Moving down that way! It's both of them! 
I see them, Jagang growled as he tracked the two fleeing figures in his black glare. I'd recognize that bitch in the farthest reaches of the underworld. And there, Lord Raal is with her. Jensen could catch only fleeting flashes of two figures racing away past windows. Emperor Jagang sliced the air with his sword, signaling his men. Surround the palace so they can't escape, he turned to his officers. I want the assault company to come with me, and a dozen sisters. Sister Perdita, stay with the sisters out here. Don't let anyone get by you. His gaze sought Sebastian and Jensen. When he found them among those standing close, he fixed Jensen in his hot glare. If you want your chance, girl, then come with me. Jensen realized, as she and Sebastian raced away after Emperor Jagang, that she had her knife clenched in her fist. Chapter 48 Close on Jagang's heels, in the shadows of towering marble columns, Jensen raced up the wide expanse of white marble steps. Sebastian's reassuring hand was on the small of her back the whole way. Fierce determination etched the faces of the savage men bounding up the steps all around her. The men of the assault company, sheathed in layers of leather armor, chain mail, and tough hides, wielded short swords, huge crescent axes, or wicked flails in one hand, while on their other arm they all carried round metal shields for protection, but the shields were also set with long center spikes to make them weapons as well. The men were even swathed with belts and straps set with sharpened studs to make grappling with them in hand-to-hand -hand combat treacherous at best. Jensen couldn't imagine anyone with the nerve to go against such vicious men. Storming up the steps, the burly soldiers growled like animals, crashing through the carved double doors as if they were made of sticks, never checking to see if the doors might be unlocked. Jensen shielded her face with an arm as she flew through the shower of splintered wood fragments. The thunder of the men's boots echoed through the grand hall inside. Tall windows of pale blue glass set between polished white marble pillars through slashes of light across the marble floor where the assault force stormed through. Men hooked the marble railing with big hands and swooped up the first stairway, going for the upper floors where they had seen the Mother Confessor and Lord Rall. The sound of the soldiers' boots on stone echoed up through the high-ceilinged stairwell decorated with ornate moldings. Jensen couldn't help being wildly excited that this might be the day it all ended. She was but one mighty thrust of her knife from freedom. She was the one to do it. She was the only one who could. She was invincible. The fact that she was going to kill a man was only dimly important to her. As she raced up the steps, she thought only about the horror Lord Rall had brought to her life and the lives of others. Filled with righteous rage, she intended to end it once and for all. <laughs>